All right. Well, the April 30th first ever Zoom video virtual meeting of Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission is called to order. Um, I don't virtually have a, a gavel, so sorry, no gavel. Um, it's really wonderful to see everyone. I know that if you're um, if you're not speaking, you may have your video off just to preserve interconnection bandwidth. So for internet, so. That's fine, but for those of you that we can see, it's really wonderful to actually see you. Um, I know it's been tough for a lot of people, but really for everyone. And, um, and so I just really appreciate everyone taking the time to continue to do the good work and the good business that we need to do. Um, let's go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance. And, uh, and then we have, a, we have a nice surprise for everyone on the pledge. I think, I think you'll enjoy it. And then we'll go ahead and do roll call. Dion, can you queue up the pledge? Maybe. Is Dion still on? Looks like he's going to be I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thanks, Dion. A little John Wayne to get us started. Why not? Uh, Laura, can you go ahead and do a roll call just so we know um, everyone who's on the line? Um, Adams is absent. Lecca? Present. Bray? Present. Garcia? I'm here. Haskett, I believe, is absent. Hauser? Yes, present. McDaniel? Here. Schaefer? Here. Vardy? Present. V. Hill? Yes. Chair Zimmerman? I'm here. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Laura. And I do want to make one, um, one statement just for kind of for the record, on the record, however, however we want to say that but um per per rulemaking we um i just wanted to let everyone know with regard to public comment because of course typically we have a full room of folks and people can just sign a blue sheet and do a public comment right then and there and so for people on the line here who who haven't been as intimately involved with how we're doing public comment as um as a lot of us have been i just wanted to make a a, a quick statement that We've received a lot of written public comment. Thank you for people who have provided written public comment. And of course the commissioners, that's all in our packet. Um, and we do read those, so thank you. We have also, we do have some public comments today via Zoom. So people who have signed up in advance um, and that link was available on the website. It was sent out through all of our outreach um, push networks. So I think hopefully people knew that they could sign up to make public comment. So we will be hearing that today. Um, and we're just, you know, given this, trying this new platform and figuring this out, we're trying to keep CPW business moving forward. And um, at this point in time, uh, we believe additional in-person public comment is unnecessary. And we're, and that's what we need to say for the, you know, state for the rulemaking. So just wanted to make sure we have that in there. Um, we, of course, we, public comment is incredibly important to both the commission and to the agency. So I just want to make sure that we, we got that statement out there. Um, with that, we can go to the first um, item th that requires a motion, and that's approval of the minutes for both the January 15th, 16th. Actually, there's three minutes that need to be approved here. If you, um, they're linked on the agenda on your, on your iPad devices. So an, I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes of January 15th, 16th, 2020 Par Parks and Wildlife Commission meeting, March 30 and April 6th emergency rulemaking conference. 
And I think you can just, okay, thanks Marvin. Great. Second. Second from Luke. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, Any corrections to the agenda or any um, corrections the removal to consent agenda items. And I think, sorry, just as a matter of administrative, um, you can either raise, I think let's try raising hands. Um, when we do a, a motion, I guess like that motion, we didn't raise a hand, but I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. If you go down to the part, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, participants comes up. If you click on that, you'll get a little window and you can select the raise hand. So if you have any corrections to the agenda or removal corrections to consent agenda items, if you wanna raise your hand and then I can call on you um, or you can just unmute and introduce yourself. Okay, I don't see any hands or hear any voices. As I'm scrolling through the participants, it looks like Commissioner Adams did join us. Commissioner Adams, are you with us? And I think Commissioner Haskett's going to be with us for part of it. So she's just off for a little while. Okay, great. I'm all, this is Commissioner Haskett. I'm here. Oh, great. Okay. Well, good. Glad we've got everyone. Um, okay. Let's, um, I don't think we have any, I don't have a space in here for Commissioner comments. Um, does anyone have a burning comment they would like to make. You can either just unmute yourself or raise your hand. Okay. Um, I don't think I have any other thing. One other comment I did want to make um, two other comments. So I did do a crosswalk of the March agenda and went through every agenda item and made sure that we had covered it either on the emergency right rulemaking or on today's meeting or at the May meeting. All of those things are covered. The only thing that um, got dropped off that we're gonna hear in June is an update to the CPW operational plan, which is the implementation portion of our strategic plan. And that we're gonna hear in June. So everything else on the March agenda, I, I kind of made a check of, and so we should, we should be okay with regard to not um, dropping anything on that. And then um, the only, and if anybody wants to see my little checklist, you're welcome to, uh, just let me know. And then I also um, just saw the partners in outdoors going virtual. And, uh, and so I just wanted, I know that that was gonna be this week. So it just seemed apropos and timely to say, um, thank you and congrats and thanks for all the hard work to make that happen. And I'm excited to join that. Um, all right, let's, if, if there are any other comments, please just raise your hand on the, on the raise hand thing. And with that, we'll go to Director Gibbs if, if Director Gibbs is on. I don't see his name in Michelle, the list. Michelle, this is Dan Brunslow. I just got a text from him. He's not able to, to call in, so skip him and he's still trying. So if we see him come on, we'll try later, but skip him for now. Okay, great. Well, then, um, how about Commissioner Greenberg? I, I think I saw her name. Uh, I'm here. I have the Durango background, but I'll put myself on camera as well. Sorry, and it's um, Director Greenberg. I apologize. I just was reading Department of Ag Commission and then. <laughs> oh, it's, it's Commissioner. It is Commissioner. Okay, good. Whatever you want to call me. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Um, good to see everyone. Um, Gosh, it's been a while since I've, um, I think, joined you. So I want to say thank you to Wayne East, who's also, I believe, on the phone um, and who represents CDA at these meetings regularly. Really appreciate his work um, showing up for us. And just in general, want to give a huge um, shout out to all the Department of Ag staff. Um, our over 300 staff across the state um, have been instrumental in all of the changes we've been um, going through these last many weeks. So. I'll just give a quick operational update and then a quick update on the world at large that we're um, kind of managing over at the Department of Ag. So back in mid-March, um, we 
really uh, kind of hit the ground running on telework scenarios. So we've got um, about 80% of our workforce is uh, in, in teleworking right now. Um, a lot of our field staff, we've actually suspended some of our uh, field uh, services just to make it through sort of the initial weeks of COVID-19. Uh, and then we're reevaluating for the season right now. So really working through at the ground level um, to support our teams and getting back out into the field and upholding our critical inspections uh, and then reinstating our, our other inspections as time goes on. So really just kind of looking at the um, micro level across the department to make sure we're upholding customer service, upholding all of our responsibilities from afar. And so far our team has just done an incredible uh, amount of work to get us there. It's really been a smooth transition, but took an immense amount of work. We were um, quite prepared for it in a lot of ways. We had instituted a flex policy last year, had people starting to work from home already just as a benefit. Um, so a lot of our team was ready to make a very quick pivot um, to continuing our work from home. So just a huge shout out to, to CDA. Um, for those of you who interface with our department, um, we have very few visitors, um, really next to none at the office in Broomfield anymore and have our services online. So phone, email, of course, tons of uh, video conferencing, um, even doing some inspections via um, virtual inspections via video has been part of our changes as well. Um, we've set up a number of, <clears throat> um, excuse me, teams at the department that are responding to COVID-19. We've got um, kind of the, the first thing that we did was set up a food security task force. And so I've got my team um, led by Tom Lepetsky, our markets division director. We've got about eight or nine staff from across the department. who are really combing the whole ag, food and ag supply chain, looking for pinch points, risks, threats, um, and working to both mitigate and resolve them. Um, that's been a really important team because as I'm sure many of you know, all sorts of issues come up uh, spur of the moment and require very fast response. Um, and that's everything from um, making sure we can keep producing um, uh, sanitary products for uh, food processing um, to pinch points in processing like we're seeing now for on the meat and cheese side. Um, we have also set up an ag recovery team. Sorry, my dog's barking in the background. Um, and so with our ag recovery team, we are um, implementing our recovery planning at the same time that we're responding to COVID-19. So um, our team led by Jordan Beasley, who is our policy advisor and ledge liaison. Um, I think he's part of about 11 task forces right now. <laughs> I haven't gotten the latest count, um, but I'm sure many of you are feeling this. We've got a lot of teams that we've built around COVID response. Um, so our ag recovery has really been focused on state and federal advocacy for bringing relief dollars to Colorado agriculture. We've been partnering with OEDIT um, and the governor's office, as well as many other state agencies, private partners, um, to really orient priorities for ag recovery, ag investment at the state level, and then uh, really putting a lot of advocacy at the federal level for relief dollars um, through both the SBA programs and uh, CARES Act dollars that have been uh, uh, authorized through USDA. Um, we're also continuing to work on potential future relief packages, um, making sure that Colorado gets uh, uh, you know, our share of relief that our producers are uh, taking care of as much as possible um, at all levels of relief. So a lot of work going on there. Um, of course, dealing with uh, supply chain Issues um, continues. I think you know, I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing um, concerns of as to whether you know we're going to see meat shortages. So um, you know, right now we do not anticipate that. Um, we are working through uh, those kinks in the processing uh, supply chain, kind of at the processing point in the chain uh, that you all, I'm sure, are well, well aware of. Um, really making sure that we hammer home the importance of worker safety, worker health. Of course, without a healthy workforce, uh, we don't have a food supply chain, um, but we're also at the same time doing everything we can to help keep um, supply moving and facilities open. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work going on just today, um, sort of reviewing our uh, regulatory authority at the department, both here at the state level, but also thinking through what uh, options at the federal level do we have to alleviate pinch points in the system, um, to build more resilience in the system. You've seen uh, an incredible amount of pivoting going on where you know, our producers were selling um, 
into restaurants and food service overnight, those markets vanished. And now all of a sudden we've got to figure out how we move that product to new markets, primarily grocery stores. That's been a huge part of our work and work with folks in the field. We've seen that with farmers markets too, um, where, you know, we're not going to a um, open um, kind of floor model where you have um, vendors right next to each other and customers coming in as they will. A lot of markets are looking at online sales, pre-orders, um, pre-packaged uh, product. Um, so we're really supporting our ag community in making those pivots wherever we possibly can to make sure we're minimizing food waste, minimizing um, issues around animal welfare. That's a big concern in other places. Um, and we're doing everything we can to mitigate for that here and then making sure we can do everything possible to get food where it's needed. So we've got really strong partnerships with uh, food banks and the food access community too, and uh, continue to make sure that we can be a support for them in accessing the food um, that they need. So much going on here. Um, of course, there's additional work around PPE and testing for critical workers. That's been a big part of our work. Um, especially with our federal advocacy, uh, with Secretary Purdue, with uh, Vice President Pence, um, and all of our agency partners at the federal level as well. Um, we also do have a livestock working group that's a public-private partnership and is really doing incredible work scanning the whole supply chain for risks on the livestock side and doing incredible work to resolve those problems and plan for the problems we can't immediately resolve. Um, so we've got dozens of CDA staff who have, I've recruited to COVID response, um, and this is on top of their daily work, of course. Um, so really trying to support everyone as much as we can, build a really strong bench in all these regards. Um, we do play a critical support function at the Emergency Operations Center at the state, um, which is primarily around livestock. Um, but our assistant state vet, Maggie Baldwin, has been an um, incredible asset for us at the EOC representing agriculture. She was also uh, the lead in standing up the um, future planning team, so coordinating um, many other agencies in uh, COVID response overall. So really proud of the work our team has done um, to respond to this event, to plan for it, mitigate um, you know, envision what recovery looks like and advocate for our producers across the state. Um, there are non-COVID uh, items uh, underway. It's hard for me to conjure what those are right now since kind of COVID centric, as I know many of us are. Um, hemp continues to be front and center. We're working on our state plan, um, kind of heading toward the end of our CHAMP initiative, which was our Colorado Hemp advancement and management plan that we initiated last year. Great stakeholder input and incredible work by our team. Um, and lots going on again, just kind of getting ready for um, inspections to kick back up, field services to kick back up, um, and a lot of ongoing work uh, on the day-to-day -day by all of our staff. And I believe that is it for my report, unless there's any questions for me. Thank you, Commissioner Greenberg. Any comments, questions, follow-up for, for Kate? Okay, sounds like we also had Director Gibbs join us. So, um, Dan, if you wanna give your presentation, that'd be great. And I yeah, think we also have to. Commissioner Adams on. Great. Um, I apologize for my delay. I had a little technical uh, challenges uh, getting on, but uh, it's great to see you all, and um, uh, thanks for your presentation, Commissioner Greenberg. It's always great to see you. We're um, everything, as you could all imagine, is uh, geared towards um, COVID-19. So, um, cabinet members, we meet, um, you know, I would say daily, uh, almost daily, on you know sharing information and how we collaborate. Um, and you know, as you can imagine, the DNR is not you know, front and center for uh, COVID-19 like CDPHE or public safety, or, or frankly, um, with Commissioner Greenberg and on a lot of the ag safety with food safety that she's working on. But we also are, are playing a, a role. We've, um, we've uh, supplied some of our public information officers um, to help out with what's called the Joint Information Center. So that's more or less um, through the Emergency Operations Center. Um, so all agencies are really, you know, working um, together on, um, uh, on, on this response. So um, even though we're in the midst of, you know, challenging times, 
uh, we are working hard to provide uh, critical services for the state of Colorado. So I wanna thank you and the rest of the commissioners and Director Prinslow for conducting this meeting. I think it's very important to continue um, our important work uh, within the Department of Natural Resources. We're also continuing to work with our other uh, divisions. For example, um, just a week and a half ago, we had our state land board meeting. We've had groundwater commission meetings. Uh, earlier this week, we had um, oh, about 250 people or so participate in our oil and gas conservation commission hearings. Um, so I think that's really exciting that we are continuing to work and we're, we're um, uh, able to get stuff done still. Um, we, the DNR is, is continuing to work on our shared stewardship MOU. Uh, the governor signed that uh, last, um, it, was, it was kind of our early fall. And um, we are also coordinating with Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative and that's something that the Wild Turkey Federation has really helped spearhead to partner with the US Forest Service on. And then we're also working with um, our state forester, Mark, Mike Lester on his Forest Health Advisory Committee. We're really working hard to try to just all collaborate together to make sure that we're all on the same page, working towards the same goals. And, um, and I think those meetings are, are going very well. Um, on the oil and gas front, we are continuing to work through our rulemaking process that we have before us. As uh, you may recall, I've given updates on Senate Bill 181. That was the, uh, the oil and gas, I would say, um, overhaul bill on how we do things you know, differently in Colorado with, with a um, lens through protecting public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. And um, rulemaking process is um, still going on. Um, and actually this um, Friday, we're planning on, if it's not this Friday, it's in the near future, um, the 1200 series, and that deals with, with lot wildlife resources. And that really uh, ties in parks and wildlife uh, to oil and gas so that um, uh, parks and wildlife can really have, a, um, can weigh in on, on oil and gas you know, activities around the state. Um, on the waterfront, we're continuing to have our basin roundtable meetings remotely. That is very important uh, as we look forward to uh, approving and um, highlighting what's called our basin implementation plans. And as you can imagine, to get water projects off the ground, it's, it's it has never been kind of a top-down approach. It's always been, let's hear from the basins and see what projects trickle up where um, the state can be supportive of. And, and as a result of that, um, you, you help um, take, take meaningful steps in implementing the Colorado Water Plan that the governor has been very, very supportive. So we are continuing to hold you know, water meetings. Um, and then um, you know, outdoor recreation, Director Prinslow will probably uh, bring this up to you. Um, uh, Dan and I um, have been working really hard to coordinate with the BLM, the US Forest Service, local governments on kind of the larger uh, land managers to coordinate you know, outdoor recreation. Um, you can imagine with, um, uh, we've just seen you know, uptick in, in activity you know, around the state and we are working hard to promote you know, responsible outdoor recreation, really trying to uh, encourage folks to recreate locally and close to their house and one of the governor's most recent executive orders also highlighted the intent that folks need to stay within 10 miles um, of, of their house. So um, we do not wanna encourage folks, for example, that live in Denver to you know, head up to the high country and other kind of rural areas um, to recreate if at all possible. Um, and then also uh, Kate mentioned um, kind of response. Um, Commissioner Greenberg and I both are members of um, the, the recovery task force and that's part of the governor's innovative response team. And so uh, you can imagine uh, during this time, um, many different, um, uh, different user groups and outdoor recreational interests are trying to get guidance to figure out, you know, hey, um, is, is whitewater rafting gonna be open this summer, for example, you know, we need to start training um, rafting guides. And I'm a former rafting guide myself. So I, I 
remember that fondly where you have to get a certain amount of trips in a certain amount of people in order to get cert your certification. Um, but just, you know, big picture, all the different, you know, recreational activities around the state are, are looking for guidance on the possibility of them, you know, opening up for business. So, so we have a great team working on, you know, what steps uh, businesses really need to take in order to, um, uh, in order to potentially open up uh, this summer. So I think, I think that's it for my notes right now. I'm happy to um, answer any questions. I'm planning on um, staying with you all uh, for the rest of the day too. Um, so feel free to, I guess, text or I guess we can't call because um, <laughs> we're on this meeting, but uh, I'm always available. I know that some of you may have seen, um, I noticed a few of the faces, a um, few of you I think called in for our DNR town hall meeting we had earlier this week. Uh, we had over uh, about 600 participants with that, and we're we're trying to do those um, frequently so that folks, um, you know, hear kind of you know how we are dealing with COVID and the latest for our workplace environment and the services that we're providing, and so that folks, you know, hear the latest from me and my leadership team with HR and operations and so forth. Um, and I think those meetings have been going, you know, quite well. So. I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, yield to uh, Director Prinzel. Thank you, Director Gibbs. Any questions or comments for, for the director? Dan, that's great about the town hall. Um, really appreciate you guys doing that. And, and I think, I, I don't know if other, um, Groups are doing that too. I've heard maybe the PUC may or may not be doing that. I don't know if any others are are doing town halls, but I really I know a lot of people really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I'm getting a little mute. Happy. Sorry, Director Prenzel, you're on, and now I will mute. I figured that was my time. So uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks, Dan Gibbs, for your leadership through uh, up to this point and continuing uh, as we move. I'll talk uh, a little at the end about, and really thanks to the commission to, to be flexible for all the things that uh, we're doing. This is our third meeting, but our first uh, video Zoom uh, through this since we had to cancel the March meeting. So appreciate your patience uh, very much. So try not to spend too much time. We can talk like ad nauseum about uh, COVID-19, but obviously we've, we've had to pivot like everybody else. Uh, some things we've been able to maintain, I appreciate Dan and the governor's uh, ability to help us remain some semblance of normal in our parks and, and our wildlife areas, hunting, fishing, and recreating, I think has been um, uh, I'm more than I think. I, I I get a lot of emails from people that that personally either thank me or or thank the the you the commissioners from keeping open uh, the recreation hunting and fishing that we have. It's um, quite honestly kept people from um, sane in a lot of different ways. So it's been a lot of uh, mental and physical. Not about healing, but uh, preservation for uh, people that have gone through a, a very trying time. So along with that, um, we, as you well know, we did close our campgrounds on, on parks and our wildlife areas. We do have a request in to the governor's office and CDPHE. Uh, we've pushed for a May 4th opening. Um, probably might may not happen, but uh, we're, we're hopeful to get uh, at some semblance of open by mid-May, that's a real modified opening. So I don't want to get into specifics, but that would be not group, you know, group areas. That would not be group restrooms or showers. That would be individual things. So a very modified opening, and, and um, you know, if you you can help in that endeavor, that'd be great. Uh, again, part of that we we part of that's a financial issue. Part of that's a, a health, uh, not a health and safety, but a mental and physical. Uh, uh, a benefit for Coloradoans. And third, but not least, is um, Forest Service is starting to open up, BLM State open up, some of the counties are starting to open up, and so we really don't want to be 
uh, part of the problem. We want to be part of the uh, the solution as we mindfully go through that. So, um, also say on April 23rd, the governor uh, Governor Polis extended the two exe two executive orders in response to COVID-19 that that reauthorized the state. Uh, for our emergency rules, and then to extend those license and passes that we uh, had our uh, one of our emergency meetings on. So, just want to affirm um, that we reinstituted or re-extended the emergency rule for the off highway vehicle registration and permit, which was driving people to our offices. Which, by the way, are still open for business via phone, but not public walk-in and. As we transition to campgrounds, that will be the next thing that we'll work on. And so we're working on PPP, PPE, and sneeze guards, and et cetera, et cetera. But um, you know, it's important that that customer-centric uh, portion of our job starts to to reopen up as we as we reopen up in Colorado uh, in phases. So um, we did not extend the emergency rule extension on state. Park annual passes, Aspen leaf passes, Columbine passes, and annual family passes. We believe that those are readily available either online or at, at uh, uh, hard locations. Um, partly that's a financial thing and partly is that it, it will not drive people to our office. And so we thought that was a good transition to make. So just extended the off eye vehicle registration for another month. Um, if you haven't heard, you'll hear here, and it's um, most, I don't say it bad news, but it's saddening news. We did did delay, and uh, I've you're part of that decision, even though you can probably yell at me later, but we had to manage um, our partners on Fisher's Peak, the governor's office, and staff and commission. But uh, as you all know, we have a June 10th stop opening. I wanna give a shout out to, to Brett Ackerman uh, and his staff, our real estate staff. You know, we closed on Fisher's Peak, uh, rah, rah. We chose not to do a big press release because it was in the middle of this and thought that would be fairly inappropriate. Um, I think some of that word has gotten out obviously, but uh, we were planning on an in-person celebration with the GOCO board and, and, and the Parks and Wildlife Commission on June, I think that's 10th. Um, GOCO board has already canceled and gone to a, a non-in-person meeting in Trinidad. Um, we're holding on, but I probably by our fingernails, we're not sure that that will happen. Regardless, we thought it would not be wise to have an opening where we're still, uh, you know, under 10 people or less, pretty hard to have a grand opening when you can't be there. So, so we did really work hard with our partners to, and they were very, very supportive. Matter of fact, almost um, consistent that we extend that opening. So we did make sure that uh, uh, Director Gibbs and the governor were in on that. And th you're the first to hear that really publicly. Um, if you have any concerns or questions about that, we're glad to talk about that. But uh, we are playing when we would open in a soft opening by ear. We've not made any firm commitments. We talked about late summer, fall. We've talked about midwinter. We've talked about as late as 2021, but uh, we are the proud owners of that. And, and so, you know, we are still working on construction projects in there and trail projects. So, you know, we're, Brett and his staff are working very diligently out on that project. We're just not gonna hire FTE and bring on new staff and, and create problems. Um, and Trinidad was uh, absolutely okay with that. So. Uh, with that, uh, again, we'll we'll delay that opening until another time. We can all get together and celebrate that uh, our 42nd state park grand opening together. Um, last couple things, real quick. Just to, I think an interesting note. We in those emergency orders and by direction from from my office, we uh, really opened the rules to online hunter education. Rah rah to I think Commissioner Hauser. I don't I don't want to get out ahead of her, but I think she might have been one of those participants taking hunter ed class and passed. But uh, um, we really went completely online. Uh, we really worked with our partners. We, as you all know, we were really not set up to do that because we are we have a robust 
set of hunter ed instructors that that want hands-on and are an integral part of that but we open that up so we're about three times the usage of that online as people are really uh, ramping up to still try and participate in our recreation and uh, hunting sports I, I would tell you it's interesting if Kate Greenberg still on Commissioner Greenberg lots of questions about well why wait for domestic meat? I think I'm going to go uh, start working on bringing meat home to my table that I that I know where it comes from. So we're we're happy to hear that. That's uh, we still love our ag partners too. But uh, people are catching on to that message that a little self-sustaining in this time is not a not a uh, terrible idea. So um, the uh, also just the last two things. Appreciate all of our staff. Commission, um, and I really want to do an extra shout out to Jeff Versteeg and his staff, uh, Laura, uh, Katie, Jeff, uh, pulling off, uh, you know, Dion and Kirk, which is not on Jeff's staff, but this uh, Zoom meeting. There's a lot of parts to pull this on and make sure everything works. So um, new for us, we we were transitioning this way. If you remember on the little kind of train wreck commission meeting we had a couple times ago, and so. This just forced our hands and, and so here we are. So shout out to them. Last but not least, I'll leave you with my, my continuing bumper sticker, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is managing to yes while keeping our customers and our constituents safe. And with that, unless there's any questions for me, Madam Chair, that would be my short update. Thank you, Director Prenslow. Um, Commissioner Hauser, look at you with the emojis. How do you do that? She just gave you a thumbs up. Oh, I see how you did it. I'm, yeah, I got it. I see what you're doing there. <laughs> We're learning Zoom for anyone listening on YouTube. We are all learning uh, as we go here. Um, thank you. Any questions or comments for Director Prenslow? Okay, great. Well, let's jump into agenda item seven and just again, a little housekeeping before before I hand it over to you, Krista. So a couple of things on your devices. Um, if you click on the hyperlink in the agenda, this chapter, this agenda item seven, it will give you Krista's full um, overview that really does a deeper dive, kind of the executive summary, and then some on each of these items, um, as well as into the consent agenda. So it's great for a quick reference. Um, my plan here, and you know, we'll see how it goes, because so first time, uh, is to go through agenda item seven, agenda item eight, and agenda item nine. So we're gonna hear from Krista, then we're gonna hear from the citizen petition, then we'll hear from um, public comment, and then we'll have you know a vote and commission discussion. That's kind of my plan. That does not mean that you, you know, during Krista's presentation or Aubin's or shortly there after their presentation, we can certainly have commissioner question and discussion um, just after their presentation. But my goal is to hold the, the vote in full commission conversation about a vote um, until after we hear public comment, which is agenda item nine. So certainly um, just, just kind of want to try to set that expectation and see if we can make that happen. But of course, um, after Krista or Aubin's presentation, please do uh, raise your hand if in, in um, I do have the participant list open so I can see when someone raises their hand on Zoom and we'll, we can have discussion during the um, agenda items seven and eight as well. So with that, Krista, I will hand it over. Thank you, agenda item seven, um, chapter W3. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Executive Director Gibbs, Director Prenslow. Um, I am Krista Heiner, the Regulations Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And so yeah, let's get started. Uh, we have final regulations for you. So agenda item seven, chapter W3, fur bears and small game, except migratory birds. Uh, this is kind of like a white tannish color on um, hopefully on your PDFs there. Um, and I just want to make a note that this is listed as an informational item, but um, as uh, Chair Zimmerman described, that's just because we'll delay action on this until agenda item nine. Um, so that's where we'd like you to take the action. Um, and this is also listed as step one of one on the agenda. Um, and that's because the specific regulatory red line language is appearing for the first time. But I do wanna point out that the commission heard a presentation on wildlife contests by Katie Lanter in January, and then gave regulatory direction to staff. 
So in essence, this is step two of two. So before we get into the contest changes, um, I just first want to point out that on pages seven and 10, seven through 10 of your um, um, updated regulations there, we have updated the small, um, the game bird and small game season dates to reflect the date structure for the 2020 hunting seasons. So those are the changes you'll see on pages seven through 10. Uh, then on, if we go back to page, page two and three, you'll see the regulations prohibiting contests as a method of take for all fur bearer species, black-tailed, white-tailed, and Gunnison's prairie dogs, and Wyoming or Richardson's ground squirrels. And as previously mentioned, in November 2019, in January 2020, the commission asked the division to research and prepare a recommendation for limiting such contests. And this, is, this rule is the division's recommendation. So fur bears, black-tailed, white-tailed, and Gunnison's prairie dogs in Wyoming ground squirrels are popular targets of hunting contests and currently have no daily bag or possession limits under current law. Hunting contests for these species are not necessary to provide an adequate, flexible, and coordinated statewide system of wildlife management or to maintain adequate and proper populations of wildlife species nor are hunting contests for these species necessary to protect, preserve, enhance, and manage wildlife, for the use, benefit, enjoyment of the state or its visitors. Uh, so for those reasons, um, staff is proposing this recommendation. And then as you'll see in the next agenda item, we do have a citizen petition on this topic as well. And so I wanted to briefly mention staff's recommendation on the citizen petition as well. Um, so staff recommends denying the Humane Society of the United States uh, November 22nd, 2019 citizen petition to ban wildlife contests for two reasons. First, the petition's proposed modifications to chapter W3 regulation number 303 is poorly drafted. Um, it would provide that contests involving small game or fur bearers are allowed, except that contests involving small game or fur bearers are not allowed. This conflicting language would create ambiguity and would make the rules language um, difficult to interpret. Um, in short, the proposed rule would be difficult for people to understand and for courts to apply. Second, before the Humane Society of the US filed its petition, the commission initiated the process resulting in the staff recommendation to prohibit hunting contests involving fur bears and certain species of prairie dogs and ground squirrels. Staff believes this its proposed rule avoids the drafting flaws of the Humane Society of the U.S. proposal and is better tailored to the commission's statutory authority. Therefore, staff recommends denying the Humane Society of the U.S. proposal and adopting staff's proposal. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Krista. Okay, uh, Commissioner Garcia. Uh, yes, I just uh, procedurally, Krista, do you need anything from us, uh, the commission, on changing the dates on page seven through 10? Um, yes, when, when we do do a final action item on agenda item uh, nine, I believe that, that that will include the adoption of those dates. Well, that's a good question though, yeah. I just thought because we're gonna, the only other thing that's left will be the citizen petition and the contest question. Uh, if we could entertain a motion now to simply adopt the, uh, and I would so move to adopt the changes in dates as outlined uh, in pages seven through 10. Yeah, that might be simplest actually. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Um, Commissioner Bray has his hand up. Uh, so I think I think we probably need to deal with the motion from Commissioner Garcia, and then and then do a we can do a vote on that. Um, Krista, does that seem correctly? And Commissioner Bragg, go ahead if you if you'd like to let me know if you want to do a second or what, what you'd like to do there. No, I, I I do have a comment on some of the other, of Katie's uh, commentary, but I can uh, second Commissioner Garcia's well, motion. Okay, let's do that, and then let's do. Um, I think that's pretty clear. So let's do a voice a, a voice vote, um, which we're all voice votes, but whatever. We, just we sorry, do... sorry, just for clarity, this Carrie Hauser. So we're just peeling off the date, the per, sort of the procedural piece from this item, and we're coming back to the con the meat of the content. Is that right? 
Is that what Commissioner Garcia did? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Krista, Krista, go ahead if you wanna clarify. Yeah, so this would be, just be um, adopting the changes to the season dates on pages seven through 10. Um, and so this is a routine thing that we do, just updating a calendar you know, every year. Um, so this is not addressing the, the contest piece. We'll wait and save the contest piece until agenda item nine. Okay, thank you, Krista. So um, all in favor, please uh, please say aye. 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 Thumbs, aye. A thumbs up works too. Any opposed? Okay, and Commissioner Bray, uh, I think you had some additional comments, so please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I wish to comment both. Number one, I fully support staff's recommendation regarding the uh, HSUS petition. I think these are repetitious and uh, we've been down that road quite a bit. So I support staff's recommendation on the other one. On as far as contests go, I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot since our last meeting. And on the surface, I was all for it. But then as I study this and work through it, I have some, some very pretty strong concerns about totally banning quote unquote contests. And may, maybe there's a better term for it. I, I really appreciate staff's effort to thread the needle here. Uh, but I think it was back in the late nineties, Colorado was the first commission to put the rules that are existing rules around hunting contests, such as only five animals per person and, and those various aspects of that. And I think that was a good move. And I think that is now dated. I, I really have, a, I think this new proposed regulation flies in the face of private property rights, landowner rights. I think it flies in the face of, of the North American model of hunting and fishing uh, for licensed hunters and proper hunters. So, uh, I like the rule we have now, and I will, I'll, I'm going to be a no vote as far as adopting staff's recommendation at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bray. I appreciate the context. Um, any other comments, discussion, questions for Krista? Okay, well, we can certainly ask Krista additional questions as we go, um, but let's let's hand the screen, as it were, over to um, Aubin Royal, the Colorado State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, to present the citizen petition uh, regarding this topic. Welcome, Aubin. Thanks for joining us. I think I think Laura or Katie or, or one of our co-hosts is probably making sure you're able to present and all of that kind of thing, so give us give us a second here to work through it. Yes, I think I'm here and Johanna will actually be kicking off for us. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Johanna. Good to see Thanks you. Thanks very much. Good to see you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, directors, commissioners. Thanks very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today about our petition. My name is Johanna Hamburger. I'm a third generation Coloradan. I'm based in Lakewood. I'm a wildlife attorney with the Animal Welfare Institute and I have a background in conservation biology. I, along with Aubin Royal of HSUS, am speaking on behalf of the six organizations that submitted a petition requesting a ban on contests for certain species of fur berries and small game. In light of staff's proposal and presentation, as well as to be respectful of the commission's time, our presentation is going to be very brief. I'd like to first thank the commission and staff for your leadership on this issue and for putting forward a very strong proposal to ban contests for many species. Petitioners do fully support staff's proposal. And as Commissioner Bray um, alluded to earlier, in the late 90s, Colorado was a leader in this area by imposing limitations on the number of animals that could be killed um, during each individual contest by certain participants. And the current proposal presents an opportunity for Colorado to again lead the country on this issue. By adopting this proposal, it would be really a significant achievement that I think the commission and the administration could be very proud of. 
Um, in making their recommendation, staff did recognize that hunting contests are not necessary to adequately and flexibly manage wildlife or to maintain adequate and proper populations of wildlife species. And that conclusion really is fully supported by the best scientific data available. And it's in accordance with the findings of numerous fish and wildlife agencies and commissions across the country, which have, have concluded that contests are really counterproductive to effective management of wildlife populations, that they don't increase game populations and that they do produce negative ecosystem effects. Um, and while our groups do fully support staff recommendations, we would like to ask you to consider a slight modification to the list of species covered by the proposal. And we'd like to ask the Commission to consider specifically including the following game mammals. Those would be cottontail rabbit, snowshoe hare, white-tailed and black-tailed jackrabbits, a squirrel, pine squirrel, and a bird squirrel. And we do fully recognize that there are already bag and possession limits for these species, but we ask you to consider adding them for two reasons. The first is that although we are not aware of any contests in Colorado that currently target squirrels and rabbits, they are common targets of contests throughout the United States. And we do have concerns that what we would see is that our state would shift to target these species if they're not included. And that's exactly what we saw happen in Vermont when they banned contest targeting coyotes. Um, they simply switched to target squirrels after that. And the second reason we ask these species to be included um, is because squirrels and rabbits are vital prey base for Colorado's carnivores and maintaining a robust prey base is very important for minimizing wildlife um, human conflicts. And regarding the snowshoe hare in particular, um, as we know that species is absolutely essential for the survival of Colorado's Canadian lynx population. That species is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And we all know that CPW has spent a significant amount of resources to successfully reintroduce them into our state. Um, thanks very much for considering those additional species. Um, overall, the ban that's been proposed by staff, if it were to be adopted, would be a very critical step towards ensuring that Colorado's wildlife is managed in a way that is sustainable, humane, and to the benefit of all Coloradans. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Aubin, who's going to discuss the issue of ethical hunting. And then at the end of Aubin's presentation, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks again very much for your time. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, my name is Aubin Royal and I'm the Colorado State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this issue and we also thank the staff for their proposal, um, which Johanna said we do fully support, so we're excited about that. Uh, staff's recommendation to ban killing contests aligns with the CPW approved hunter education course that's online. Uh, this course contains themes that are at odds with killing contests. Um, one section starts with a quote from Aldo Leopold, often referred to as the father of wildlife management, in which he says, quote, ethical, ethical behavior is doing the right thing when no one else is watching, even when doing the wrong thing is legal, end quote. These killing contests are a great example of something that is ethically wrong but currently legal in our state. In the course, the word conservation is defined as the wise use of natural resources without waste. Uh, killing contests are not a scientifically backed tool for wildlife management, and as such, they represent a waste of our natural resources. Finally, uh, the course cites the North American model of wildlife conservation as the foundation for the success um, of fish and wildlife conservation in North America. One of the key principles of the model states, quote, the reasons for killing wildlife must be valid. Wildlife shall be taken by legal and ethical means in the spirit of fair chase and with good cause. Animals can only be killed for a legitimate purpose, end quote. Seeking cash or prizes for animals killed is not a legitimate purpose. Coyotes and prairie dogs, the most commonly targeted animals for contests in Colorado, are not killed for their fur or for food, and they're not killed in self-defense. The argument that these contests help protect property and livestock is not backed by science. The truth is these contests are for entertainment. We should follow in the footsteps of other states and outlaw this unethical and wasteful practice completely, as it is at odds with the North American model and the very conservation principles that CPW is teaching its sportsmen. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Johanna and Aubin. I um, 
really appreciate you taking the time and, and learning learning our Zoom interface, which you probably were already quite good at, but thank you for, for being here. Um, any questions, comments, discussion for Ms. Hamburger or Ms. Royal? I'm looking at the icons here. Madam Chair, this is Jim Vigil. Please go ahead. Thank you, Commissioner Vigil. Uh, I have a question uh, for uh, Joanna, if I could. Yeah, uh, please go ahead. She she prepared a memo that that uh, looked at uh, contests in Colorado and indicated in all in 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 multiple places that there was uh, no fundraising associated with uh, with those contests. So when when I read that. It would it would cause me and and probably other people to believe that the uh, if the contest included fundraising for for an organization like say uh, wounded warriors or tunnels to towers or local youth groups, then uh, the organization would be uh, okay with the contest. Thank you very much, Commissioner B Hill. Um, so the petitioner's position and the reason that I included that information in the memo was specifically to address um, some issues that were raised at the January meeting. Some commissioners had questions about whether or not these contests were used to fundraise. And so the goal of including that information in my memo was to get a better understanding of what we actually see happening with contests in Colorado. And so as you um, mentioned, there are only three contests that we found in the past five years um, out of a total of 18 that had a fundraising component. And so what we found was that these contests, really the vast majority of them did not have a fundraising component. Um, they had cash pots or prizes that were for private gain. Um, and in terms of your question about whether or not we would support um, contests if they did include a fundraising ele element, um, the petitioners would not support those contests, even if they did include that. And it's our position that while we certainly laud um, that some of these contests did benefit um, very worthy organizations, I think we do need to consider that um, there are innumerable ways that organizations can fundraise and that the indiscriminate slaughter of Colorado's wildlife really is not one of the appropriate ways in which to fundraise. So we, we would be opposed to that, even if more of these contests did start to include fundraising components. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Commissioner Hill. Any other uh, questions? Oh, I got a hand raised. Uh, Marv, Commissioner McDaniel. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we got you. I have a uh, question for Joanna. You talked about the addition of uh, specifically rabbits, other game species to the prohibition. Um, maybe you could give me your thoughts about, you know, underneath our current regulations, for example, with uh, those species, they are game species with seasons and limits, but they also require that the game that is harvested in those seasons uh, be taken and harvested for human consumption. So not, I'll call it a waste of wildlife. Um, so what would be your concern then with regards to the contest uh, if the animals are consumed? Right, thank you very much, Commissioner McDaniel. Um, I think that's a very good question. And what our primary concern would be is the way that competitions can skew incentives um, with the award of cash prizes. So what we've seen in Colorado is typically we have um, contests where you have a cash pot of over $1,000 um, in many instances. And so instead of, and again, while we recognize that for the species that I suggested adding that there are bag limits um, and possession limits. Some of those are on the high end. Um, so for rabbits, for example, um, for each of those species, the limit um, per day is 10. Um, so what we have concerns is that we would end up seeing people who otherwise maybe would not um, 
go for the full 10 if they're in a position where they're competing with other teams, where they're competing with, um, for a very significant cash pot or other prizes, um, that we might see a, a very significant depletion of that prey species within a, a targeted area because that's um, what we've seen, um, for example, with coyotes, all of these co contests are limited to a very specific geographic region, and you have high numbers of, of animals killed in that region. And so if you have high numbers of prey species um, that are being killed as a result of these contests, that's going to put stress on the overall ecosystem. It's going to put stress on our predator species in a way that could unbalance the ecosystem and cause additional conflict. Um, with humans and other species. So that, that's the genesis of our concern and why we would ask the commission to consider adding those additional species. Uh, as, a, as a quick follow-up, I guess uh, my question is based on, you mentioned other states that switched to that. Um, you wouldn't happen to have any data with regards to that. I mean, the reason I ask is, you know, there's been, as I'm sure you're aware, a dramatic decrease and the number of sportsmen who hunt rabbits or, or those kind of species, and then of course the number of take um, over the last couple of decades. Um, and I haven't seen any data indicating those wildlife species have a, uh, a population issue um, you're addressing, or is this just a concern you think might arise or that concern you mentioned did arise in a different state where it had to pull that back because of the impact on the, on the population. Right, thank you, Commissioner. I do appreciate that distinction. Um, so in terms of the actual population impacts, there hasn't been data collected that we've seen in terms of how these contests impact the particular local prey base. Um, in terms of how these species are con um, targeted by other states in different contests, um, as I alluded to um, during my presentation, what we have seen is in Vermont, um, where they banned contests for targeting um, coyotes in 2018, the very next year they had a first annual um, hunt contest hunt that attracted um, and targeted specifically their squirrel species. Um, and then in the past five years, we've seen 34 contests across the country in 13 different states that have targeted squirrels and rabbits specifically. Um, however, you know, as I said earlier, there hasn't been a population survey to determine the impact on that those contests would have on the prey base in those um, particular locations, but that is our concern um, that we could see that happen, and it's a particular concern, as I mentioned, for the snowshoe hare, considering the fact that they are the predominant prey item um, for Canadian lynx. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McDaniel. Um, if just a point of clear, just a point of clarification, um, snowshoe hare are currently listed. We're not, we're not currently, we don't have a bag limit associated with snowshoe hare, do we? Do we? I guess I'd have to look back at our regs. Right. So I had checked the regs and it's at least based upon my reading, it indicates that all of our um, rabbit species, including the snowshoe hare, um, have a season of October 1st through the end of February, and the limit is 10, the daily bag limit is 10, and the possession limit is 20, and that does include snowshoe hare, and, and as my reading, um, that's my reading of it. Okay, yeah, I'll look further into that. Um, and, and I'm happy to send... But thank you. It wasn't on my radar. You. Okay. Yeah, I have, I, have, I have it all here, just I hadn't um, okay. Um, any other question, comment, discussion for either Krista or for the citizen petition? Okay. Um, I have one, we'll, sorry. Yes, please go ahead. Commissioner Hauser. Um, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to ask these questions. Um, and, and some of it harkens back to Commissioner Bray's comment. I would just like clarity. Uh, it, it would still be a private landowner's prerogative to um, uh, mitigate a species that may be doing damage to his or her land um, just, without, just without a contest. Is that correct? 
Okay, I'm seeing a, a thumbs up from Jake. I just want a clarity on that. And then at Wafua in January, it seems like a million years ago now, um, a number of us heard from other states, uh, Arizona and others that have uh, sort of been in, in advance of Colorado have have uh, instituted similar bans. I would just, if staff or, or anyone could help us and those that were not at Wafa understand um, sort of what the outcomes have been, what the lessons have been learned, what's worked well, what might not have worked well, um, would appreciate just hearing a little bit of that. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Hauser. Um, who would like to take that? Is that a Director Prenslow? Madam Chair, I think um, either uh, Jeff Versteeg and or uh, Christopher Katie are, are there, so um, we'll answer that specifically. They've got that data right in front of them. Yeah. Madam Chair, I can try to start that answer, and then if Katie or Jeff want to add in, um, you know, I'll feel free to jump in. Thank you, Krista. Um, yeah, no problem. So Arizona does have a, a ban on predators and fur bearer species, and in the memo that uh, Katie sent to you all, um, she addressed some of the you know, lessons learned. I think um, in her memo, she says in January, the commission asked uh, to know more about the final decision in Arizona to ban predator and fur bearer contests. And speaking with the Arizona Fish and Game staff, we learned that support for banning these contests was high. Over 15 sports persons groups uh, attended the, or supported the ban. And the action was consistent with their commission's work to address practices they felt were inconsistent with the North American model of wildlife management. Um, so that's just one, one example. Um, yeah, some other states as well, um, New Mexico has a ban on coyotes only, Massachusetts a ban on predator and fur bearer species, uh, Vermont as we've already, already talked about, um, coyotes, um, and California a ban on fur bearers and non-game animals. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Hauser, or would you like more, more details? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I read the memo, um, I just, for benefit of those who weren't at that weren't there and and recognizing that there have been states that have been ahead of us on this conversation always just helpful to helpful to understand what those outcomes have been and what what they've learned and and particularly you know partners or other organizations that have come uh to those commissions and and testified or offered petitions um helpful to us in our deliberations as well yeah i don't know if others um who have had conversations with with other wildlife agencies have more to add to that. Um, that's that's as far as I know. Katie or Jeff, anything to add there as you were doing your research into other states and how they've done that if it's been uh, by the by their game and fish commission per you know fishing game, how whichever state it is or if it's um, been done by other in those states how any other uh, comments to add. This is Katie Lanter. Uh, no, I don't have anything to add. I think uh, you know it's pretty well covered in, in the memo. Katie, I think we lost you. Can anyone hear Katie or is it my internet? Oh, no, I was just brief. I'm, I'm done. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions, comments, additional um, points to add? Commissioner Bray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to reiterate, I, you know, I appreciate the outreach to other states. This is a fairly new emerging issue at WAFA and, and some of the other states. I think we gotta be really careful of of comparing apples to oranges here, because Colorado's significantly a different state than than those others. Uh, some of the same issues, but then our variety of life, wildlife and our numbers of wildlife are significantly different than than those other states. And I still reiterate, this is a private property issue. I have no issue with uh, banning of uh, valuable prizes. I don't know for sure how you identify what that is. I have no no issue, but it can be a form, a hunting contest. I mean, we're, we're going down a slippery slope here. Uh, there's all sorts of 
wildlife contests. Uh, granted, this is directed to fur bears, but it's a slippery slope when you consider uh, bighorn sheep, for example, the Grand Slam that all sheep hunters aspire to get to. Uh, you have localized uh, deer and elk and other animals uh, contests, so to speak, uh, big buck contests, where you might just get your picture in the papers. Uh, and, and it's no different with coyotes or prairie dogs or any of these other species. Uh, I, I, I'm still on the same. I think we've got a really good regulation in, in place. I don't think it's been abused in the last 20 years since it's been in place. And I think we have the ability to hold this thing at a responsible level. So that, that's just where I stand on it. Thank you for allowing me to comment. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Bray. Um, any others? Commissioner McDaniel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I strongly believe in, in in following with, with Chairman Bray or uh, Commissioner Bray's comment about us following the North American model um, of wildlife management and concern around private landowner rights. I appreciate the input about um, that as a landowner, they still have opportunity if the staff recommendation were to go forward to manage um, wildlife uh, within our regulations for agricultural uh, or, you know, other depredation or other legal purposes available to them outside of a contest. Um, it is a concern to me in reading the public comment that many feel that this is a threat to hunting overall, uh, chipping away at hunting rights uh, within the state. Uh, at the same time, I read another public comment um, in addition to that that stated that there's a lot that was um, different um, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, you know, 10 years ago. Um, that's not uh, still in effect today in that the wildlife regulations are, are constantly changing. Uh, and within that, in looking at the North American model and some of the comments, uh, I do believe there is uh, a question around contests and the perception around that with our uh, both wildlife consuming public and non consuming wildlife consuming public uh, and citizens uh, in the state of Colorado. So for myself, uh, I, I believe that we're still leaving the opportunity available for private landowners uh, to manage their properties within legal um, uh, regulations will still have on board. And at the same time, uh, I believe that within these hunting contests, uh, that this is the staff recommendation is a good one. Uh, and unless there's further comment about it, you know, I would move that we deny the commission, I mean, deny the uh, Humane Society, the citizens petition, uh, and approve the staff's recommendation on the wildlife hunting contests. Thank you, Commissioner McDaniel. Um, so we've, I'd, I'd like to hear public comment um, prior to making that motion. Um, so I might ask Jake, can we can we do a motion in a second now and then hear public comment, um, or should we hold Commissioner McDaniel's motion until after we have public comment? Uh, why don't you why don't you hold? Why don't why doesn't the uh... The motion just sit there waiting for a second take the public comment and then ask for a second okay thanks jake um is that okay with you commissioner mcdaniel i had to unmute yes it is thank you okay great thank you um commissioner behill did you i saw your your uh, phone icon come up did you have an, a comment as well uh yes i I, I uh, really echo uh, Commissioner Bray's uh, thoughts because agriculture is really suffering now, and this this type of uh, uh, this type of a petition and a ban on the contest would just really make things worse for agriculture. And uh, you know, right now in Southern Colorado, I don't know how it is up north, but we're in a heck of a drought down here, and people 
that raise cattle are suffering. And the coyotes don't do a lot of good for, for newborn calves. So uh, I, I am just opposed to making any change to the ban we have on contests. I, I think right now what we have in regulation is fine. And that's, that's my comment, period. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Behill. Let's um, let's move. I think we're already we kind of morphed. So nice segue um, into agenda item um, nine, where we're going to have discussion, uh, motion discussion, and and let's go ahead and hear public comment. Um, I think that's typically how we do it in person: is we we hear public comment and then we have motion and discussion. So let's, if others don't mind, let's go ahead and do that. Um, so Katie Lanter is going to help me call on and unmute and. Uh, pub members of the public that have signed up for public comment. Um, so, Katie, do you want to do you want to jump into agenda item nine and help me out there with public comment? Yes, sounds good. Thank you, Chair Zimmerman. I'm Katie Lanter, Policy and Planning Supervisor for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and I do want to thank those members of the public who signed up to provide uh, public comment during today's meeting. Uh, now that we've moved to a virtual meeting format. We are asking people to sign up in advance of a meeting and the link to sign up for uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, we have a, a submit public comments page on the commission's website. So I encourage you uh, to refer there if you have any questions about how to sign up to comment for future meetings. Um, today, I'll be calling on each person who signed up for public comment by name, um, at which point my colleague Sarah will unmute that person's line. I'll also be asking if you'd like us to turn on your camera. Um, if, and so once you're unmuted, you can let us know. Um, and so there may be a slight delay while your line is being unmuted. And I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations of names. Um, we'll let you again know that you've been unmuted and can begin your remarks. Um, each person is limited to two minutes of time, and I will let the person know when your time has elapsed. Uh, after each person speaks, we will pause and the chair will see if there are any questions from the commissioners for uh, the person that has just spoken. Um, once we've confirmed that um, any questions from the commissioners have been addressed, uh, Sarah will mute that person again and I will call on the next person. Um, so we'll more or less uh, follow the same procedures. Um, for this uh, particular agenda item, we did have four members of the public that signed up. Um, two indicated that they were in support of the citizen petition and two um, in support of staff's recommendation. So I will just alternate between those two lists um, in the order that people signed up. Um, and I believe that's it. Um, Chair Zimmerman, anything that you'd like to add before we start then? Nope, thank you. That's very well explained and, and sets up our expectations well. So thank you. Um, go ahead with public comment. Okay, so I think first we have uh, Christine Versilino. Um, Christine will unmute your line just a moment, please. And Christina, it looks like you've been unmuted. Would you like us to turn on your camera? Yes, that's fine. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, give us just a moment, please, while we do that. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm just waiting. It looks like, Sarah, are you able to do that for us? Yeah, she might need to approve um, okay. the video to start. Oh, there I am. Okay, <laughs> then, uh, Christine, I think you're ready to go, and I will start your two minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak briefly today. My name is Christine Versalino from Colorado Springs, and I'm so very proud to stand with the citizens' petition to ban wildlife killing contests in our state. In my opinion, these sadistic contests are nothing but a blood sport, cruel and sporting based on unfounded facts and outdated prejudices against our native carnivores and other animals. People in Colorado like me and many of our tourists care deeply about native wildlife and appreciate seeing animals alive versus contests which encourage the needless suffering and killing of our native animals for cash, silly prizes, and bragging rights. Shocking undercover investigations, 
many times with children attending and participating, reveal why we need to put an end to these horrible contests. More and more people are learning about the gruesome spectacles that they are and will continue to speak out about them because they are hidden many times from public view. And again, our tourism industry, people come here and I really believe that they want to see wildlife al alive and not under constant threat of persecution. As we've learned today, many states are banning these contests and Colorado, I believe, needs to follow suit and consign these brutal contests where they belong in the past. There's no science, there's no conservation, and there's no humane stewardship of the little wildlife that we really do have left that's trying to survive. We're better than this. Thank you so much for your time. And I respectfully urge you to consider the citizens proposed petition led by renowned humane organizations and end these contests. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bersalino, your time is up. Thank you. Uh, Chair Zimmerman. Thank you, Ms. Bersalino. I appreciate you taking the time and, and sitting with us today during this meeting. Um, any, any questions, comments um, for, for Ms. Bersalino? Okay, I don't see any hands, but if anything comes up, I think you're, I think Christine, you're going to stay with us for a little bit so we can certainly come back. Thank um, you so Katie, much. do you want to call the next? Thank you. Katie, do you want to call the next public comment? Yes, so next up we have Johnny, I don't think I'm going to get this right, Lecoq, is that right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. Good. <laughs> good. Um, would you like us to turn on your camera? Oh, that's fine, thanks. Okay, just give us a moment, please. And you may, it sounds like you may need to hit something to accept on your side. Okay. Yes, there we can see you now. Um, has your name still over your face? I'm not sure about that piece. Sorry about that. Um, uh, but if you would like to go ahead, we'll start your two minutes. Good. Uh, again, my name is Johnny Lecoque. I'm the founder and CEO of a Colorado outdoor recreation company called Fish Pond. Uh, we're a fishing, primarily a fishing products company. Uh, and I prepared just a brief statement because I know I need to be very concise here. So I'll move forward into my comments. Uh, but on the behalf of the Colorado outdoor recreation industry, uh, to include both hunting and fishing, we respectfully request that you take the action to prohibit wildlife killing contests in the state. As a new home to the Outdoor Industry Association summer and winter markets, trade shows which attract thousands of well-known brands and some of America's most innovative products, Colorado has the opportunity to be the leader in how our country honors the most valuable of our American assets, a lot of that which is our species. Our wild and open lands and the animals who inhabit them are the most valuable assets we have, have as citizens to help grow our economy and our unique way of life depends on their vitality. There's a critical link between the health of our ecosystems and the health of our economy and jobs, with the outdoor recreation sector being the significant driver of growth in our state. The vitality of Colorado's economy is in due large part to the majestic beauty of our wildlife and our wild lands, and as such, we feel a responsibility to leverage our market strength to promote the importance of conservation and the shared connection we have to our fragile ecosystem. Wildlife killing contests where participants are awarded prizes for killing the largest or most of a targeted species are not only a stain on the outdoor recreation values that contribute to the most significant economic sectors of our state, but are also an embarrassment to the very essence of our national identity and, under, and irresponsibly undermine the core value of coexistence. When, uh, I'll just say that killing contests show complete disregard for life and threaten the future of Colorado's legitimate hunting traditions. Um, as a growing and vital industry that depends on sustainable ecosystems, the outdoor recreation industry recon recognizes that our efforts must be collaborative and in partnership with CPW and our collective desire to promote ethical and traditional hunting values must be consistent with the activities we support. As a lifelong hunter and an angler, and as a business owner- Your time is wrapping up. Okay, okay. well, I'll let that go, but I appreciate your uh, uh, decisions on this matter and the values that uh, this represents to the state of Colorado and how it uh, will project to all other states in the country. Thank you, Mr. Lacoque. I appreciate you your taking the time to, to be with us today. Any um, questions, comments, discussion for Mr. Lacoque?
Okay, thank you. Um, I think much like Christine, you'll, you'll stay with us for a, a few minutes. If anyone does wanna come back and have a conversation, we can certainly do so. Um, Katie, would you call the next public comment? Sure, next up we have Joanna Lambert. So give us a moment, Joanna, while we unmute your line. Joanna, it looks like you're unmuted. Would you like us to turn on your camera? Sure, thanks. Okay, just one moment, please. Let me just check. Uh, okay, yes, it looks like we have you on camera, so um, you may begin your two minutes. Excellent. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners, for your time and consideration today. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this important discussion. I am a Colorado citizen, a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and a science advisor to Project Coyote. I fully support the ban to end killing contests and urge the inclusion of Leporidae and Sciurids, as they too are frequent targets in killing contests. There are many reasons to ban killing contests and I will focus on coyotes to illustrate my points. In short, our best peer reviewed science shows that indiscriminately killing coyotes is counterproductive. Coyotes provide numerous ecosystem services, including keeping rodents in check, consuming carcasses, contributing to biodiversity and indirectly controlling disease and protecting crops. Furthermore, killing contests can actually prompt coyote population increases by disrupting social structure, increasing pup survival and encouraging more breeding. Wildlife killing contests may actually increase conflict with humans, pets or livestock. Human exploited coyote populations tend to have younger animals that haven't learned appropriate hunting behaviors. Also, killing contests do not target problem causing coyotes who have become habituated to humans. Importantly, indiscriminate killing of, con of coyotes will not boost the abundance of game species like deer. Coyotes have diverse diets and generally favor rodents and rabbits. In sum, Killing contests are ecologically unsound and do not serve the goals that their participants claim. Moreover, like dog fighting and cock fighting, killing contests are ethically indefensible. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Professor Lambert. I appreciate your time um, and your comments as well. Any questions or discussion for Professor Lambert? Okay, um, seeing none, we will go on to the next public comment. Uh, Katie, could you call the next name? Sure, so the next person we have is Heather Camissa Davenport. So Heather, give us a moment while we unmute your line. Uh, looks like you're unmuted. Uh, would you like us to turn on your camera as well? Yes, please. Okay, just one moment. Oh, I have to approve. Okay. Great, so we see you, so you can go ahead and start your two minutes. Thank you very much. I um, wanna thank Chair Zimmerman and the, um, all of the commissioners for making this meeting accessible. Um, it's good to see everyone. Um, my name, uh, as Katie said, Heather Camisa Davenport. I am a resident of Kelowna, Colorado, over here on the West Slope. I too have um, some prepared statements um, in testimony to support the citizen petition to ban wildlife killing contests. Um, there are many aspects of my life that contribute to my strongly held belief that we must ban wildlife killing contests in our state. I live with my husband on the Western Slope in Uray County on 38 acres of land. We are outdoor enthusiasts, food gardeners, and owners of a cafe in the tourist town of Ridgeway. We treasure the array of wildlife, including coyotes, bobcats, mountain lions, ground squirrels, with whom we share our property and our community. The mountains, the wild animals of Colorado is what drew us to this beautiful state. Uh, these animals as individuals and as species enrich our lives and the experiences of our customers when they travel to Ridgeway. We delight in spotting these animals in their wild state. and We deeply appreciate the many ecological benefits they provide to our community. 
Killing contests, we feel, are a blemish on Colorado's reputation as a tourist playground. These events damage our ecosystem and they're antithetical to the values that Coloradans hold dear. They send the wrong message to the nation that life is cheap and wild animals are disposable. This contradiction to what Colorado promotes to tourists and what the majority of us hold dear is not good for Colorado's economy and businesses such as mine. The outdoor recreation industry is one of our state's most important economic sectors. It depends on the health and vitality of our wildlands and our wildlife. Perhaps more than any other state, Colorado should be a leader in the protection and conservation of our environment and the animals who inhabit it. Your time has elapsed. Oh my goodness. Okay, in closing, um, we just ask that you please um, and thank you for taking this issue very seriously. Um, and I thank you again for making this meeting accessible. Thank you, Ms. Camisa. Uh, Camisa, right, or Camisa? You, you both did great, Camisa. Okay, Camisa Davenport, thank you so much. Um, I love that part of the state, beautiful area. So thank you so much for taking the time and, and joining us today. Any uh, discussion or questions for Ms. Camisa Davenport? Okay, um, I think Katie, is that all of our public comment um, on this yes. topic? Yes, that is everyone who signed up to comment on this item. Okay, so in addition, um, just as a reminder, and I know that all the commissioners are well aware of this because our emails have been, our email inboxes have been full upon waking and sleeping <laughs> recently um, on this topic and others. So just, you know, for others listening in, we have received a number of comments, both for and against um, the, the citizen petition um, sort of slash staff recommendation, I suppose, uh, over the past couple of weeks. And so while with this virtual platform, public comment, in-person public comment takes on a new form where we need to sign up in advance, we are paying very close attention to all the public comment we're getting, the written comment we are receiving um, via email. So I just want to remind our commissioners and remind our listeners that we we are receiving that comment and um, and we do very much appreciate the time and attention. Um, so with that, I think what I'd like to do is ask for Commissioner McDaniel's motion again, and, and we can do a second, and then we can have commission discussion um, around that motion and second prior to calling a vote. And um, I've got Commissioner Garcia with his hand up. Go ahead, Commissioner Garcia. No, I'm simply waiting for Commissioner McDaniel's motion. Oh, got it. Commissioner McDaniel, would you like to make that motion? Or I can just call it. Is there, um, is there a motion? Where do I have it? Uh, to approve the division recommendation for Chapter W3 and to deny a citizen petition on wildlife contests for the reasons stated in the division's response. So moved, Commissioner McDaniel. Thank you, Commissioner McDaniel. Is there a second, uh, Commissioner Garcia? Second. Okay, second by Commissioner Garcia. Let's have commission discussion. And then Laura, just so you're prepped, we'll, I'll wanna do a roll call vote. Okay. Um, all right, so commission discussion. Um, oh, Laura, look at you. you, you gave me a thumbs up. I'm so impressed with these people's Zoom abilities. Um, Dan Gibbs, I think Director Gibbs also wanted to make a comment. Um, Director Gibbs, are you still? available uh, to join us? Yeah, can you hear me? Great, gotcha. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I really appreciate everyone's thoughtful comments. Um, and I do appreciate the differing views, you know, on this topic and, and unique perspectives that, you know, everyone brings to the table. So as you all know, I don't get a vote on this agenda item, um, but I do wanna say just a couple quick words. Um, for me, hunting contests don't sit well as a sportsman. Um, I'd never participate in one personally. Um, hunting's an important, reverent tradition in Colorado and powerful management tool. But I also think wildlife killing contests give sportsmen and sportswomen a bad name and damage our reputation. So thank you. Thank you, Director Gibbs. I appreciate that. And I think um, 
I think that might help us for a little discussion as well. Um, I see Commissioner Garcia already took his on, so I guess that, do any other commissioners, um, I know we've heard from a little, but don't know if others have comments or thoughts. Okay. Oh, we got one. Commissioner Schaefer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will echo much of what uh, Director Gibbs said. It, it is something that uh, I think paints uh, sportsmen and women in a, a, a poor light at times. However, I also want to recognize that um, many of the comments that we received, uh, particularly from hunters, uh, echoed something that um, I also have concerns about, which is what seems to be a non a nonstop uh, sort of string of uh, either petitions, proposals, or efforts to um, constrain uh, what have been you know long held practices when it comes to wildlife use, whether it be contest killing trapping, um, elimination of certain species under game species, what, whatever it may be. Um, there is, there is a, a, a concern that has been raised and I think it's a valid concern. I think that weighing uh, that in light of this proposal is important to understand that there's still uh, a lot of management tools available um, when it comes to fur bears and, and other species um, and that we are still endeavoring to provide for as many hunting opportunities as possible um, with the greatest breadth of species, seasons, dates, whatever it may be. Um, so I, I appreciate this being brought forward uh, as a citizen petition. I also will highlight that the commission initiated this discussion um, last November. Um, this was something that uh, I believe Commissioner McDaniel had brought to the floor uh, as a discussion item and there has been you know a fair amount of discussion uh particularly at that january uh meeting uh earlier this year as well as uh, a bit uh on the updates and i appreciate all the staff's work on making sure that we we're abreast of what other states are doing and what all of our potential uh, opportunities are thank you thank you commissioner schaefer um commissioner blecka Hi, uh, thank you. So I just wanted to follow up, you know, I was um, pretty vocal against the ban initially when we, or I guess the, the petition initially when we um, heard about it and that hasn't changed. I just kind of want to dovetail off of what Commissioner Bray and what Commissioner Behel had mentioned that this is, this creates an unnecessary barrier to the agricultural community. It's impactful to personal property rights. It's impactful to the idea of rural or agricultural self-sufficiency. When you take away the opportunity for a community to protect itself, to create money or an economic um, avenue, whether it's a fundraiser or if it's bringing people into town, I think that there is a human impact to this ban that is being overlooked. And I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Commissioner Blecka um, and Commissioner Garcia. Uh, yes, I just want to thank uh, Commissioner Schaefer. Well said. Uh, you basically capsized or captured, uh, captured everything that I wanted to say. Uh, and recognizing all of the hunting groups and other organizations that have come forward with all of the emails and statements that we've received. Uh, I want it to be very clear uh, that as a sportsman's representative, I understand those concerns. Um, and I believe that uh, all of the things that you are saying are correct. Uh, I still believe that this is one where I think uh, we need to sometimes uh, correct some of the things we do, but it is in no way, I hope any attempt uh, to start chipping away at our rights as hunters in the state of Colorado. And so I just wanted you to know that we continue to support your organizations and the individuals that have come forward in their 
objections to the citizen's petition, uh, but I still feel it's necessary as a commissioner at this time to support the division's recommendation. And I'd be glad to discuss this with any of the groups or individuals uh, offline after we're done with this at any time. Sadly, I would offer to come and meet with your organizations, but during this particular time, I don't want to meet with any more groups of more than 10 and certainly maybe even more than two. So uh, absent that, I'd be glad to and happy to discuss this matter further offline. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Um, any other comments before we do a, a, a roll call vote here? Okay. Just uh, if you just clarify the vote before we do it, since there's been all this conversation, just want to make sure we're clear on what we're voting on. Yes, I certainly can. So um, the motion is to approve the division recommendation for Chapter W3 and to deny the citizen petition on wildlife contests for the reasons stated in the division's response. So that, that's the motion on the floor. We've had some discussion. Um, I think we did have some discussion also around um, the citizen petition additional species that perhaps they wanted added. I haven't heard a motion to um, to do that or to do anything different from um, Commissioner McDaniel's original motion. So unless there's any augmentation to that, I think we can go ahead and do a roll call vote. Does anyone have any additional comments? Okay, Laura, oh, I almost, Commissioner Schaefer, go ahead. So there was a, mo we're talking about the motion from Marvin and was that seconded by Charlie, uh, Commissioner Garcia? It was, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay, Laura, please go ahead and call the roll. So I'm sorry, as the first. Oh, yes, Commissioner Adams. <laughs> so is, and the vote is about I'm sorry, I get confused with the languaging. So are yep. we voting on approving the staff's recommendation or are we voting to deny the citizen's petition? I'm, I'm still confused, I'm yes. sorry. Is there, is there something written that I can look at? I'm having, the auditory part of this is not good for me right now. Fair, fair <laughs> enough. So what we're doing is, is we're basically combining um, number seven and number eight. And the reason that we are, the reason in my brain that we're talking that we're doing that is because they are very similar so it would cause a lot of confusion to either to to approve both let's say because then you'd have parallel two things kind of going on a parallel path that don't need to be that need to be combined to one so what we're talking about here is combining items seven and eight into one vote mm -hmm. and the vote is the current motion is to approve staff recommendation regarding contest killing and deny citizen petition regarding contest okay. killing thank you that one more time yeah no problem and we you know if it's if we need to we can separate that into two i just um i'm thinking because they are so similar that taking it in one keeps it streamlined thank you okay laura please go ahead adams yes lecca no bray no. Garcia? Yes. Haskett? Yes. Hauser? Sorry, yes. McDaniel? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Vardy? Yes. Vigil? Did you get you my to, no vote? Um, there we go. There we go. I have it now. Thank you. Chair Zimmerman. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Um, we are, believe it or not, a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, we have a 15 minute break written in at this point in time on the um in the agenda. So I, I do think that that would be helpful for everyone to get up, walk around and um, maybe get, you know, get refreshed a little bit and then we can come back in 15 minutes. It's currently 2.45. Let's come back in three at three o'clock 
And um, we can start up it there with agenda item 10. And so, sorry, it, the best thing is just to either put yourself on mute and put your video on mute so that you don't have to dial back in. Um, that's the best approach. Okay, thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you.
Great. Sounds like we are back. Dion, thank you for being the master of ceremonies in the in the background there. Um, okay. Laura or Katie or someone, can you tell? Are we are we still good? Do we have every we everyone we need to have to be able to continue on the agenda? Or Krista. Uh, Ms. Uh, Chair Zimmer, would you like us to call a roll again just to make sure? Um, I don't, uh, sure. Yeah, just for the people on the phone so they know who who, who all is on um, the Zoom conference. Okay, so. At least uh, among the Laura, commissioners. Yeah, Laura could call the roll. Okay. I Thanks, see Laura. Adams. Present. Blecka. Not back yet. Bray. Here. Garcia. Here. Haskett. I see her there. She's muted. Hauser. Yes, I can see. Commissioner Haskett trying to say yes. Just put your thumb up, Commissioner Haskett. There you go. 
<laughs> Daniel? Here. Schaefer? Here. Vardy? Present. V Hill? He unmuted himself, so I can see he's there. And Chair Zimmerman. Present. So you Thanks, have Laura. A, you have a quorum and you're just missing Commissioner Blecka for the time being. Okay, yeah, I see her. She's still listed, um, so she just probably needs, needs to turn her video and, and um, mute back yes. on or off. Okay, thank you. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna give myself a high five. We made it through the first half of the agenda on our first vir virtual commission meeting. Way to go, team! <laughs> when I made a comment to Dan, to Director Prenzel. I think that I th I made that about as smooth as cheese grater. But hey, here we are. We're gonna keep going. So, um, Krista, you're on with agenda item ten. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, we'll keep on going. On to agenda item 10, chapter W9, wildlife properties. Um, these regulations are sort of green in color. This is an action item, step two of two. And the issue at stake is requiring a valid hunting and or fishing license if 18 years of age and older to access all state wildlife areas in state trust lands leased by the division. So you may remember that regional manager Ackerman presented some background on this issue to the commission in January, and he's available again today to provide some additional information. So I will just summarize the issue briefly. Um, while, you, while many state wildlife areas and state trust lands leased by the division have specific regulations governing access, timing, and type of use, these properties are currently open to the public for access and use with no remuneration required. Field staff across the state have grown increasingly concerned uh, with the shift in use of many of these properties in recent years to free camping and, and hiking destinations as primary activities rather, rather than wildlife related recreation use. So to protect the integrity of their, these properties for their intended use, which is the perpetuation and conservation of wildlife and wildlife recreation, regulation number 900C.1 has been added which you can find on page one, to require all persons 18 years of age or older uh, to hold a proper and valid hunting or fishing license to access any state wildlife area. Similarly, regulation number 902.B.5 was added, which you can find on page 51, which prohibits access to state trust lands leased by the division to all persons 18 years of age and older who do not hold a proper and valid hunting or fishing license. Related regulations can be found on pages uh, five, six, and seven, which exempt persons from the requirement uh, to have a proper and valid hunting or fishing license who are accessing state wildlife areas under a commercial use contract, a special use agreement, a person maintaining utility or road easements, or businesses or persons involved in or maintaining an existing lease. Additionally, property specific regulations were modified accordingly including removing the annual access permit requirement for Jumbo Reservoir State Wildlife Area, Lake DeWeese State Wildlife Area, Pruitt Reservoir State Wildlife Area, and San Luis Lake State Wildlife Area. And also removing regulations that allowed properties to be open outside of these regulations for CPW sanctioned education outreach events. Uh, with that, I think I will turn it over to Regional Manager Ackerman for further information. Thanks, Krista. Uh, Brett, are you are you on? And I think I also got a, a note from Laura that um, Renzo's on and, and may have some other resources uh, if we if we need help on other, any of these coming agenda items. So Regional Manager Ackerman. Yeah, that is true. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm happy to be here. I uh, can't unmute my video, unfortunately, so someone might have to do that on the other end. All right, am I visible now? There we go. There you go, Brett. Great. You're on Thank camera. You so <laughs> Thank you so much, Dion. I appreciate the uh, great work on the back end, too, to get this uh, up and running via Zoom. And excited to be here with you today, Madam Chair, members of the commission. I'm Brett Ackerman, Southeast Regional Manager. And uh, 
Uh, although I am from the Southeast Regional Manager, as I mentioned in January, I'm here representing all the regions on this issue. It's an issue that we've been working on for a long, long time. Um, and as Krista so aptly summarized, uh, this is an issue that we, you know, has flown contrary to the use of these properties for quite some time. Um, you know, we think of public lands in Colorado or a wonderful public land state, but these properties specifically were acquired uh, as per the uh, commission policy um, in accordance with state law, state wildlife areas be acquired and managed for the preservation and conservation of wildlife and their habitat and to also provide wildlife related recreational opportunities to the public so long as such uses are compatible with wildlife and habitat management goals. So these properties that we're talking about, um, the state wildlife areas were specifically acquired to provide wildlife habitat and their secondary use is intended to be wildlife related recreational use um, behind wildlife habitat uh, use for, for uh, species in Colorado. Uh, and there, you, you know, we have seen heavily increased non-wildlife related use uh, on these properties for quite some time. And it's been a difficult philosophical issue because we certainly are on board with getting people in the out of doors. Um, but it's gotten to the point where there are many impacts uh, on these properties to their intended use. So as I mentioned in January, we put together a statewide team, uh, an AWM from each region, and then Bob Thompson from the uh, the field services branch. And that team was led by Renzo Del Piccolo in the Southwest region. And uh, the other members were Mark Lamb in the Northeast region, Lyle Seidner in the Northwest region, and Mike Trujillo in the Southeast region. And they did a lot of great and hard work during a difficult time period and, and, and worked very hard on this. I promised you back in January at the issue stage that we would try to be back here in May with final regulations. And that's what we have as, Chris, as Krista just uh, explained, uh, much because of the work of these folks here. Uh, they, they did a lot of work. They uh, reached, uh, researched all, all the camping related issues on all of our state wildlife areas. They researched potential nexus issues, including diversion for use for non-wildlife related use, program income uh, uh, implications, uh, other restrictions associated with federal dollars used to acquire properties and all of those types of things, as well as statutory and, and policy uh, research. And we asked them to consider a suite of options to address the issue. And uh, so they've come forward with some options and I'll, I'll circle back to that in a minute. But back in January, we were specifically asked by Commissioner Adams to take a look at some examples um, and bring back some examples so that you could see some of the things that we're talking about. So I wanted to uh, work a little magic here and see if Renzo could project his screen for us and just show you a couple of issues. All right, and Renzo, we just see your title slide there. So if you can move to the second slide. Thank you. So one of the first issues that we have here is a residential type camping where folks have come and taken up a temporary or semi-permanent residence on state wildlife areas. This is a good example of one of these. And, and certainly this list that we're gonna show you is just some examples as Commissioner Adams requested, not a comprehensive list of all the issues we're dealing with, but wanted you to see that often these types of, uh, you, you see these in other places besides state wildlife areas as well. And they often come with a lot of debris and other things that uh, uh, most often is left behind when a person leaves. Um, we've got a couple other examples of what these look like as well. Here's one that's a little less impactful, but uh, a little more uh, frequent. And then we even have some hard-sided uh, semi-permanent residences as well. And what that always ends up in, if you'll go ahead to the next slide, Renzo, is uh, cleanup. You know, so this is one of those instances where this is an impact, certainly on wildlife and the resource and the habitat, but this is a heavy impact on staff, this type of use. And so you can see in this slide, we've got uh, brought in a tractor and, and we have to, you know, pay to dispose of these items. Uh, at times it contains hazardous waste and other uh, bio waste that we have to dispose of in a specialized way uh, and handle in a specialized way. And so our techs do a great job of working on our state wildlife areas and cleaning them up. But this has unfortunately become an increasingly uh, frequent activity, some significant um, cleanup, and it does take a, a pretty good toll on staff and resources. Thanks, Renzo. We also have uh, you know, other types of use. This is, you can see those of you that uh, enjoy the out of doors in the high country, these are snowmobile tracks. This is a state wildlife area that we specifically acquired for its winter range value. And uh, you know we winter 500 to 1,000 elk in this area. And so certainly the use of snowmobiles in this area pushes those elk 
out of this area uh, into adjacent areas and, and makes this uh, specified state wildlife area not useful for its intended purpose. Thanks, Renzo. There we go. We also have, uh, you know, we suffer from certainly defacing and graffiti and other other actual uh, non-wildlife resource damage on our state wildlife areas, as you see here. And so, you know, curtailing the, the non-wildlife related use of state wildlife areas and the ability to take up residence there, uh, we're hoping does some, we understand it won't do everything, but hopes, we hope it takes a good step towards curtailing these issues. And we have just a couple more, I think. And this is very common, you know, and this, yeah, you that have been on the commission for quite some time have talked about this uh, a lot over the years. And uh, we do have very benign non-wildlife related use uh, in some cases, but also it can be significant in others. You can see these folks are out here walking their dogs and, uh, you know, dogs and other canids definitely have an impact on ungulates especially, but other small game species as well that use these habitats. And so they put a lot of stress and a lot of strain, if not actual damage, uh, to wildlife, uh, and, and I'm not certainly saying that, that that's always the case, but it, it, it definitely is a consideration when we allow domestic animals uh, on you know, habitat intended for wildlife. And then we also have other recreational use, which we love, um, but in this case, this is a state wildlife area. You see that three, at least three out of the four boaters here are paddle boarders, and this is a, a lake that uh, local outfitters often send paddle boarders to in the southwest part of the state. Um, and uh, the, the issue with that most often is that you are put in the situation on a popular weekend where uh, the parking lot, uh, which was intended for anglers, is very crowded with paddle boarders and uh, there, there's no place to park or to work with your fishing gear to get in the lake. So what we have is certainly an impact on staff and on resources, a potential public health issue. We also have you know, impacts to wildlife, uh, impacts to the habitat and degradation itself certainly, uh, you know, defacing and other issues, uh, displacement of wildlife, uh, displacement of the intended users of these properties. So that's just a smattering of some of the issues, but it really kind of illustrates the, uh, the, the diversity of non-wildlife related issues that we're dealing with out there. Thank you, Renzo. I think that's the end of our slides. So appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, discussion. Commissioner Schaefer asked us at the January meeting to take a look at what other states are doing with regard to this, because this certainly is an issue that's that's uh, only confined to Colorado. This is something that our uh, other states are very concerned about as well. Uh, this is a, a very ubiquitous point of view amongst wildlife agencies throughout the state that have these kinds of properties for these kinds of purposes. So Renzo and his group did survey all 50 states to see what they were doing and take a look, look at uh, uh, what issues they might have and how they're addressing them. We got uh, 26 states that responded, and of those, about a quarter said that they already do what we're proposing here today, which is requiring a hunting or fishing license to enter the state wildlife area. So there are some states that have taken this action already. There are others that are looking at this action, uh, but have not yet taken it. Um, certainly, we, we were broader than that in our questions to the other states, and we talked about you know, federal aid issues and camping and seasonal use and time of day restrictions and other things that we're very interested in help to help curtail this kind of use. Uh, one of the other issues certainly that we dealt with was potential replacement of program income from the Fish and Wildlife Service and federal dollars. You know, those of you that have been around for a long time know that when we had the habitat stamp out there and required that to enter state wildlife areas, that was a very short-lived issue, although it was well intended uh, because it created a program income issue with, the, with federal dollars and diminished the amount of federal dollars that were coming in to the state by the amount that we gathered for the habitat stamp. And so it was a, it definitely was an experiment with great intentions that, that didn't work out well administratively for us. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has uh, assured us in writing that that will not be the case with hunting and fishing licenses, that we could require a hunting and fishing license to go on a uh, state wildlife area and it would not raise program income issues so long as we didn't uh, you know, uh, go outside that box. So to summarize, uh, you know, Krista did a great job at, at first of the actual restriction that we placed on there. Boy, we had a lot of debate about this internally. And Renzo's group, again, did a great job of reaching out across the state to uh, our folks internally. Uh, and we came out with a regulation that essentially says to enter state wildlife area, you've got to have a hunting or fishing license. Uh, it does have some caveats in there for other administrative uses of state wildlife areas, but we tried to keep it as uh, tight as possible and not create specific exemptions 
as Krista mentioned, we even took the other day use access permits off of our four state wildlife areas that are out there and are replacing them with this restriction. That will cause a lot of uh, educational discussion out there. And we've got a road ahead of us to help people understand what we're doing here. But as a cash funded agency and one that has properties specific to the care for wildlife under the North American model, it seems important to us that if there are gonna be folks out there on state wildlife areas, they should at the very least be contributing uh, through the purchase of a license. Now we understand that won't take away all of our concerns here. And so there are you know, a number of issues that we wanna to continue to look at, but we wanted to, you know, this was one that we thought was, was very simple and one that was uh, very understandable and straightforward and one that we could execute right away. While we take a look at other more site specific issues and camping issues and access issues, vehicle issues, and other things on a statewide basis that might be more of a diverse discussion uh, throughout the remainder of this year and then come back to you at your next chapter nine cycle, which starts next January with some additional uh, potential uh, discussion points and uh, potential restrictions associated with these properties. The uh, kind of the, the, the motto of this group has been to take back the state wildlife areas for their original intended use. And uh, we believe that this regulation takes a, a strong step towards that. And once again, uh, thank you for your questions and your, uh, and your direction back in January, which helped us uh, you know, plan the path forward. And once again, thanks to Renzo and his group. Uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Um, a couple of quick reminders for me, I guess, um, for both January and, and previous. So one, you already, you touched on this with regard to outreach and some of the timing of when this um, regulation will go into an enforcement type stage. I know that typically, and I think it's in here, um, I'm pointing at my iPad because nobody can see me, <laughs> but I think it's in here that uh, we, you know, the timeline, because of course, any time we do a change like this, we, people need to have a chance to, to learn that this is new and not just get slapped with a, a fine or something um, out of the gate when they didn't know. And then my other question is um, around, I, I think we talked about this in January with regard to um, why a hunting and fishing license, why not a separate type of pass or, um, or similar. And, and so I don't know if you wanna to speak to either of those or both. Um, and then other commissioners, if you, oh, I do have hands raised. Okay, so Brett, I'll let you go to those and then I'll call on the um, raised hands. I sure can, Madam Chair, thank you. As far as timeline for implementation of the regulations, if you pass this as final today, then the regulation would become enforceable the 1st of July. Uh, as with all new regulations, particularly one as broad reaching as this, and I believe Assistant Director Dugan is on the, on the line if we need to chime in more about our standard policy, but our policy is to first educate, and particularly when we're talking mostly to the constituent users of, of state wildlife areas, you know, we wanna help people understand, and we certainly are not in a position where we wanna try to catch people off guard and uh, you know, write them tickets. Uh, in the end, we want to curtail the uh, non-wildlife related use to the extent that we can and return the properties to their original use. But, uh, uh, you know, we certainly, our standard procedure is to have a, a year's worth of warning and enforcement uh, at a minimum generally when we have a broad sweeping regulation like this. And that's the direction that our director has given us here as well is to educate, educate, educate. Um, the other question that you had, Madam Chair, was associated with a different kind of permit. Uh, like the access permit that we have on four of our existing state wildlife areas. And those do have federal implications. And so, uh, you know, certainly there are others who are a lot more educated on this than I am, but it's a situation where we receive a certain amount of uh, federal aid from Pittman Robertson dollars and Dingle Johnson dollars. And uh, if we have what they determine to be program income that's not associated with hunting and fishing licenses, um, that amount can be deducted from the aid that they give us. And so you're in a situation where you, you have a permit like we do on four state wildlife areas in a very uh, deliberate way. And then we, we end up losing some federal dollars associated with those kinds of things. But that just illustrates how much of an issue this is that we're willing to on these four specific properties to move forward in, in that way, knowing that, um, and it is a detriment to, to users, kind of a double detriment to users, in that they're being displaced and that we're losing federal aid dollars associated with that. Same would be the case with other types of permits. Thank you, that helps. Um, Commissioner Garcia. I wanna start, uh, Manager Ackerman, by saying 
personally, thank you. And on behalf of our intended users, thank you for bringing this forward. I think this is extremely important. And I look forward to next January to see what more we can do uh, to try to resolve some of the issues on our state wildlife properties. Uh, and at this time, I would move to adopt the changes to chapter W9 related to requiring a valid hunting and, or, or fishing license for all persons 18 years of age or older to access state wildlife areas and state trace trust lands leased by the division as proposed by the staff. I will second uh, the chairman. Thank you, Commissioners Vigil and Commissioner Garcia. We do have a, a motion and a second. Let's continue to have discussion and then we can um, do a roll call vote. Uh, thank you. So Commissioner Vardy. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Regional Manager Ackerman. That was very uh, informative and wonderful. Um, I would like to just dig a little bit deeper on, on the, uh, the, the possibility of looking at additional um, uh, access permit type of situations. Is, is there any kind of permit or uh, conservation license or, or something that could be created that would not impede upon the Pittman Robbins income that we receive federally? Is there, is there any way that we could do that? I, and, and the reason I ask is I see this as a really great opportunity to, to do a prototype. I know we've spoken a lot as a commission about exploring mechanisms for engaging all the other user groups in contributing financially to conservation. And, uh, and I think this could be a, a really great way to prototype it if there is some sort of mechanism that's, that's gonna yield more income and not less. Um, and uh, yeah, so it is, it, I, I don't know, uh, regional manager or if that might be uh, Justin question or potentially director. Yes, sure, thank you. Very apt question, Commissioner Varney. And thank you for thinking in that way. I think that that's a very forward looking way to think and certainly something that we on staff have been looking at for quite some time for you know, a number of years. When the Habitat step was first conceived back in 2006, uh, that was part of its original purpose. And you articulated it very well, exactly as you just articulated, was a prototype of, you know, non-consumptive users who are willing and want to contribute, uh, having an opportunity to do so without buying a hunting or fishing license. And so we went down that road with the Habitat stamp. And you're right in the, a lot deeper than that. I would have to, you know, bring in the big guns and ask Justin or Jeff or, or the director to help. But uh, my understanding from my discussions with the Fish and Wildlife Services financial folks are that outside of a hunting and fishing license for this purpose, any other permit or license that we tried to enact would have program income Im implications. And if it may be bad, Chair. Yep, Madam, thank yep. you, Just, Justin, go ahead. Justin Rutter. I just wanted to clarify a little bit that program income in particular is not necessarily a loss of federal revenue. It is deductive from the federal grant, but we don't lose that. The apportionment still stays the same amount. The issue becomes when you raise a large amount of money and then you have trouble spending your federal grant. And I think I interrupted the director unwisely there as well. Director Prenzo, do you have, thank you, Justin. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Never unwisely, Justin. I appreciate you jumping in as our CFO. So, um, Commissioner Vardy, it's a, it is a good question. It's something that I would commit to chasing down with Steve Josie is our is my counterpart with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Federal Aid here in Denver. I have a good relationship with him. You know, on the surface, so so this group for sure talk to him about it. We wanted to be black and white that we wouldn't be penalized if we did that. So that answer is yes, but I would be glad to chase that down to see if there is some nuanced way, my word, maybe not yours, uh, that we could do that. Uh, habitat stamp didn't work. There's no question about that, but I'm not going to say we couldn't have some nuanced way. And I, I will commit to chasing that down with Steve Josie and, and get back to you. I, I would recommend that we move forward and stop some of the significant issues that we have while we look at that, but um, I'll, I'll be glad to make that commitment and great question. Thank you, Director. Uh, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, what, yes, what sorry, Commissioner Vardy. I <laughs> couldn't get to my mute. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, would it be possible to uh, pursue a motion that says uh, an approved uh, license. And so then if, if we are able to track uh, approved license or, or permit, 
rather than saying specifically hunting or fishing so that if we are able to find some sort of nuanced way to do it, then we don't have to come back and, and amend this down the way. Or is that going to create limitations? It basically approved and then and then and, and currently the only approved form would be a hunting and fishing license, but perhaps that in the future, if, if we are able to come up with something that we could then plug and play. Thanks, Commissioner Varney. I'll defer that to uh, Councillor Matter if he's on with us. I have a related question at the appropriate time. Okay, great. Let's hear from Jake on, on Commissioner Varney's question about adding to the motion, and then we'll go to Commissioner Hauser. Actually, we'll go to Commissioner, yes, Commissioner Hauser and then Commissioner McDaniel. Commissioner Vardy, is your question, I mean, the, the rule is currently structured about hunting or fishing license and, you're, and, and you would seek to expand that to an approved license? I, I think that's somewhat vague. I, I think that um, Regional Manager Ackerman could probably speak to that. I think this, this was the product of a, a great deal of thought, particularly with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the program in, income uh, implications. And my concern would be sort of leaving that open-ended um, in the event there are, um, you know, additional changes to be made, it sounds like there's a lot of interest in that. I, you know, I, I think this this is a chapter that's routinely opened. In the in the event there are additional solutions that are um, thought of, you could pretty easily insert them to broaden this. But I'd, I'd be somewhat reluctant to try and do it through um, a, 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 you know, less than a term of art. Thanks, Councillor Matter. Might I add to that just a tiny bit, Madam Chair? Please go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I had the same thought. And as he was talking, you know, I was pondering, Commissioner Varney, perhaps, you know, since we do intend to come back to you on this specific issue at your next cycle, as Director Prenzel has committed to you, we'll we'll look into that issue as well. And if there are any potential alternatives when we come back to you uh, at the next cycle, we'll include those in the discussion if that's uh, if that would meet your approval. Yes, if, I, I think if, if, if the staff is willing to, to take a deeper dive into that, uh, I can get behind this as written. Thank you. Great, thank you. Commissioner Hauser. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is somewhat germane and I asked the question of staff prior to the meeting just as I was doing my preparation, but it might be helpful for others to hear this, and it's it's sort of uh, at least in the same theme as Commissioner Vardy's question. I asked whether a parks pass might not also be an option um, for this uh, qualifying option and got what I think was a, a pretty cogent answer, at least I understood it better. So whether that's Brad or somebody that could, could explain that, um, it, it might be helpful for the rest of the group. Thanks, I'm happy to take a stab at that unless you really are looking for a cogent answer. <laughs> go, Jim, go, uh, go ahead. <laughs> I appreciate that, Commissioner Hauser. Thank you. And it, once again, this sentiment is very germane to uh, Commissioner Varney's sentiment about, you know, appropriate options for potential non-consumptive users to participate as they've expressed interest to do so in the past. And once again, I think that's a, a very, uh, a very apt uh, philosophical point of view. Um, and, uh, you know, Parks Pass for a specific uh, wildlife uh, property would cause the same issues as I understand it. Um, and, uh, you know, then you would also have a potential diversion issue with dollars going into the park side of the agency generated by wildlife properties that were acquired in part by federal aid. And so that it does create a number of administrative concerns, unfortunately. But, you know, we did use that example some, Commissioner Hauser, in this discussion that you know, people expect to be able to go, when they, when they go on a, a state park, they expect to pay for a pass and uh, they understand that that's how we take care of those properties. The same hasn't been true on the other side of the agency, but the uh, philosophy is the same. And so, you know, I've used that example that people that go onto a state park know that they've got to pay, pay uh, to be there for a specific purpose. And we're just looking to adopt that same model on the wildlife side. Does that get close to kind of what you had in mind? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I understand the sort of technical sort of response to it. I guess the philosophical reason that I asked the question, I was out um, in the Horse Thief Canyon State Wildlife Area last weekend. And there was nobody out there, of course, um, but had my parks pass with me. And there were signs all over to sort of, you know, I think there were some dated signs. Um, so I'll chat with JT about that. I learned uh, about habitat stamp and otherwise, but it, you know, it did indicate that those were a requirement to enter that area. And I, it just occurred to me that if we're trying to be the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission, 
in theory to be able to to sort of merge those assets in some ways. And I understand that technically it's pretty difficult to do that, um, or at least to influence support of either side of the agency um, would be sort of a nice to have. Um, I also understand the technical challenges as they were explained to me as to why that at least this point um, is probably more pro problematic than it, than, it's, than it is possible, so. Thank you, Doc, uh, Commissioner Hauser. Um, in the end, uh, I think that's a very appropriate sentiment as well. And one of the conversations that we're having internally is that we do have properties that are on the wildlife side of the agency that do function or, or could function more like a state park and vice versa. We have uh, properties on the other side and we are kind of taking a, 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 an initial look at a couple of those properties right now to see if we might be able to work something out administratively, much like you're suggesting, which might you know, entail a swap of property legally from one side of the agency to the other that does avoid those administrative issues. And so there's, there is another discussion associated with this going on with regard to what the most appropriate use of properties within our portfolio might be. Interesting. Um, Commissioner McDaniel. Yeah, I have a question for Brett. Did, um, is there anything else you think we need to do other than this license requirement with regards to, I don't know, either enhancing or better communicating um, the camping um, regulations around state wildlife areas, uh, including, you know, camping in a parking lot or adjacent to it? Uh, for some that I've seen that are outside the parking lot, but still on the property? Um, or is that something you just want, you think you can police uh, with the existing regulations? Thanks, Commissioner McDaniel. The answer to that for me is very much yes. The good news is here that I think that the director probably has some control over my microphone and my camera and could cut me off at any time, but uh, I don't want to get too far out in front of, uh, you know, certainly him or you as a commission, but in the field, we do have that feeling uh, that yes, uh, we do need to look further at potential restrictions, and these might be more on a case-by-case -case basis. And even camping, uh, you know, as a whole, certainly, you know, our intent's not to cut off camping uh, when it's wildlife-related camping, and folks go to hunt and camp. Um, but we do need to take a closer look on many of these properties to look at, you know, we, we want to take a look at what can we do that's global uh, to the extent that we can do that. But then we also may have to look on a property by property basis at some of the other ways to curtail these uses they, that have uh, really evolved on these properties. So that's my long answer to your short question. Yes, I think there's further work to do and uh, we're calling it phase two of this process as we work throughout the summer to try to nail that down and come back to you next January. Thanks, Brett. That's, that's really encouraging here because you know many of these parking lots in some of these state areas are pretty small, but. Some of them are a little larger and, you know, take a lot more folks in and, you know, big enough that they'll pull a trailer in and that kind of thing. So I know it's a very difficult issue for all our field personnel to deal with. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have another question with Commissioner Bray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to go on the record. I fully support this. I see, I see where these problems with the, uh, complete explosion of other forms of outdoor recreation is hitting our states. These, these properties were purchased by hunters and anglers with their dollars for a specific purpose of protecting uh, their habitat, protecting the herds and for hunting and fishing opportunities. That, that's what they were purposed for. I totally understand that, that it's a public land component but it is with reservations in my mind and, and proper reservations. Uh, I think I'm, I fully support this. I do have one question though. Uh, let's say for example, I hold uh, an elk license uh, or for the fall. Is that a qualifying license for me to go in it 24 seven, 365? Uh, or, or I'm only allowed to go in when my license is valid? That's an excellent question. Thank you, Commissioner Bray. And this was part of the discussion had by the group. And, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of days uh, mulling these types of questions over. 
because if you have an elk license and you want to go into a property during that elk season, clearly you'd be able to do so because you've got a proper and valid license during that season. But what if you wanted to go in there and scout before, you know, or the question that you ask, does that put you on the property, uh, you know, in early February or, or whenever else you might want to go in there? And the answer to that question, you know, we, we still have to iron out these bumps administratively as we go forward. But in the end, uh, what we intend is for you to have a proper and valid license and that you would be on the property specifically for the purposes of exercising that license. There certainly may be some discretion in there for specific scouting activities on a valid state wildlife area in, an, in, a, uh, in a GMU for which you hold that license. But uh, those, are, those are hard questions. And uh, you know that's a, a seasoned question. Um, but our intent is to enforce that, well, educate it first, but enforce that with regard to exercising the benefits of a proper and valid license. Did I skirt the question enough, Commissioner Bray? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, with permission. What about shed hunting? Yeah, that's a great question as well. You know, some of our, we certainly have, you all have passed some other rules associated with shed hunting and this would not overturn or overcome any of those rules. So people would still certainly have to work within the bounds of the rules that you've already put on the books. Uh, and there are properties that allow for shed hunting. And yes, you would have to have a proper and valid license uh, to go on to a property for that purpose. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bray. Um, Commissioner Haskett. I think that this is a good idea and um, thank you for all the work you've done. I do have a question with the increase in um, OHV use in more of our remote areas. Um, are you looking at putting in more um, camping spots in your phase two? Yeah, thanks Commissioner Haskett. That's a great question. And uh, the short answer is no, uh, for the most part. You know, we, we allow camping on state wildlife areas in, in conjunction with your philosophy of hunting and wildlife related recreation on state wildlife areas. We do think now it's a little too open and been taken advantage of. So kind of two parts to that question. Our intent from the field is not to expand uh, these uses at this point, but rather to curtail them. And so what we would expect, it, what we would expect to come back to you in January if there's something camping related would be more along the lines of restricting where people may be able to camp or the times that people may be able to camp or the uses for which you may be able to camp. The second part of that question, you know, you mentioned OHV use uh, of properties. We fully understand that just the requirement of a hunting or fishing license, you know, may not curtail that, that non-wildlife related use if somebody's up there just to ride an, uh, an OHV and they figure out, well, I'll just go buy a hunting license or I might already have one, you know? And so that's another issue that's philosophically potentially troublesome for your, uh, your intent of state wildlife areas that we do intend to look at uh, with regard to the, the phase two. And if there is you know, a property out there that's being used heavily for OHV use that's not wildlife related or hunting related, it's very possible that we could come back and ask you uh, to cur curtail the location or uh, timing of uh, that kind of use on a state wildlife area to be determined still, but philosophically that's kind of where we're coming from. Okay, I look forward to what you come up with in January. Thank you. Thank you, Regional Manager Ackerman, and, and thank you, Commissioners, for the discussion. Um, there, we do, if you recall, Commissioner Garcia uh, um, has made a motion with regard to this agenda item number 10, and Commissioner Vigil has seconded that motion. And, and oh, um, now we have commission discussion continued. Commissioner Vardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, in response to Commissioner Bray's uh, uh, comment about uh, a, a valid license but being in there not at the time, um, I, I guess I would I would I would prefer seeing some leniency on that from the standpoint of enforcement. If we are looking at at exploring opportunities to engage non-consumptive users in paying, you know, towards conservation, um, that that may currently be the only method, uh, you know, until or or if there's a potential to find some other sort of uh, license. So I, I think that, um, that from the value of engaging other people and contributing to conservation, uh, a, a valid license may be, you know, whether whether or not it's 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 right at, at the time of use of that license. I think it, I think it's something that 
that I would like to still see uh, encouraged so that we can get get other folks engaged in conservation and in contributing to the to the pool. Thank you, Commissioner Barney. I've, I've, I've noted that and certainly will make it part of the discussion. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Commissioner Barney. Um, any other discussion or any questions about the vote? I, I will go ahead and, and read it again, jotted it down as well. Um, the motion on the floor is to adopt the changes to chapter W9 related to requiring a valid hunting or fishing license for all persons 18 years of age and older to access state wildlife areas and, the, and state trust lands leased by the division as proposed by staff. Um, unless there's additional discussion, Laura, can you please go, go ahead and call the roll? Yes. Adams. Mm, yes. Lekka. Yes. Ray. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Haskett. Yes. Hauser. Yes. McDaniel. Yes. Schaefer. Yes. Vardy. Yes. Vihill. Yes. Chair Zimmerman. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Hey, thank you, Brett. Thank you, Krista. You're back on for agenda item number 11. All right, well, let's see if I can just pull up my notes here again. Um, yeah, agenda item 11. This is chapter W16, Parks and Wildlife Procedural Rules. Um, it is blue in color, uh, the regulation portion. Um, this is step two of two and an action item. And what we're uh, looking at today is revising the process by which the division and the commission respond to citizen petitions for rulemaking. Um, this is just on page one. Uh, so previous regulations prompted staff to file a rulemaking notice with the Secretary of State if a petitioner filed a complete citizen petition for rulemaking on time. This presumed the commission wanted to consider making a regulatory change and obligated the staff to analyze the petition without the benefit of any direction from the commission. In addition, previous regulations granted citizen petitioners the opportunity to make oral presentations to the commission, which may not be necessary in all circumstances and limited CPW's ability to manage commission meeting agendas. The new regulations require petitioners to provide contact information, a copy of the proposed rule, preferably in red line format, and a general statement of the reasons for the requested rule or revision. The new regulations do not put a strict timeline on when citizen petitions would be noticed for rulemaking and do not automatically grant citizen petitioners the opportunity to make an oral presentation to the commission concerning their, their petition. Citizens always have the right that right though during public comment. Um, these amendments maximize CPW's flexibility and efficiency in responding to citizen petitions while retaining the public's ability to bring forward proposed regulatory changes. In addition to the regulatory changes, the commission's July 8th, 2016 policy on public rulemaking petitions has been revised and a red line, um, draft red line version of the changes as well as a clean version of the draft policy with those proposed changes incorporated um, have been included for your consideration. So let's see, under the uh, updated commission policy, you can think of petitions falling into three buckets. And I just wanna try to share my screen with you. We made a PowerPoint slide to help describe this a little bit better. Let's see if I can pull that up. Hopefully you're seeing my screen. Does that look good? Not yet. We still got you, which is great. Oh. Yeah, you still have me. But. Okay. Not. Hmm. All right. This works so. You well. might have to select. I know. I know. <laughs> I always have to because I. I always have a, the multiple thing, and yeah. I always have to select the screen. Yeah, there's a uh, a blue button. When you hit the green button that says share, hit the blue button that says share. <laughs> After yeah. that, there you go. Oh, sorry about that. It worked so well earlier. <laughs> Um, it's working on it. Computer is 
protesting possibly. <laughs> Got it. All right, yay. <laughs> so I'll just try to walk you through this briefly. Um, again, this is under the updated commission policy. Uh, you can think of the petitions falling into three buckets. So we have division supported petitions um, and the process for division supported petitions is very similar to the status quo. The division would uh, consult with the chair and recommend their inclusion in a meeting agenda. And then the petition would get noticed for future rulemaking. Um, however, the timing of the hearing of the petition is discretionary. Um, so that's under division supported petitions. Under division opposed petitions, the petition would not be noticed for rulemaking and it would go on a future consent agenda um, with a written division rationale as the basis for the recommended denial of the petition. So any commissioner could then remove an item from the consent agenda if they wish, um, for example, to seek minor clarity, or if they wanted to, to schedule it for a specific agenda discussion at a future meeting. If it stays on the consent agenda, the commission will vote on it and the division's response would then become the basis for denial. There is no opportunity for the petitioner to present the petition orally unless granted by the chair. Um, however, general written and or oral public comment opportunities are always available, as I mentioned previously. And again, there's no hard and fast time frame for resolution of the petition. So that's the second bucket. And then there is everything else. So in this case, uh, division, the division and the chair and potentially the Department of Natural Resources would consult to discuss the future course of proceedings. Um, eventually, the petition will likely fall into either the support or opposed buckets, as previously mentioned, and the process would you know, continue as described. Um, again, there's no hard and fast time frame for resolution of the petition, though. So in the public comment the commission received for this meeting, there appeared to be some confusion about petitions going before the commission. Some members of the public thought that citizen petitions could be blocked from coming before the commission, uh, but that is not the case. All petitions received will go to the commission. The path the petition takes depends on which of the three buckets I described uh, the petition falls into. So with that, I think I will take any questions. Great, thank you, Krista. Thank you for that slide, that's really helpful. And just for a matter of, again, administrative, how we're gonna do this, there's, we're gonna need two separate motions, one for the changes to the regulations and then one for the actual changes to the policy. So I'll go after we have um, discussion, we do have some public comment. I'll go ahead and call for those two motions. Um, and you know, then you can raise your hand or just go off mute to either make the mo you know, to say you want to make the motion and second it and, and whatnot. Um, and we'll do a roll call each on each one. So um, any questions directly for Krista? Um, and then I want to go ahead and hear public comment. I don't see any hands going up. All right, Krista, way to be way to be clear as usual. Uh, Katie, do you want to help me with public comment again? We have two folks who did sign up in advance to make public comment on this agenda item. Sure do you, I can. Okay, got great. Um, so the first person that signed up is Roland Halpern. So my colleague Sarah will unmute Roland's line. And it looks like that's been done. Um, Roland, would you like us to turn your camera on? Sure. Okay, just a moment, please. I can turn it on to my end. Okay, very good, yes. So we do have you on camera and audio, so go ahead and start your comments. You'll have two minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Roland Halpern. I'm the Executive Director for Colorado Voters for Animals, and I wanted to thank the Commission for allowing me to testify today. I, while I understand the uh, some of the intent of the bill, I'm troubled in my reading of the proposed changes, as it seems to be moving from a bilateral process of public engagement to a unilateral one where citizens are losing the ability to petition for changes in the rules and the regulations. For example, it removes a citizen's, quote, right to petition, unquote, and replaces it with, quote, request, unquote, which is much weaker language. In the, and in the case of a petition request, 
and if it's denied, it leaves the citizens a little alternative except to seek a legal review. And I think most would not want to go through that process because of the costs involved. In addition, the proposal removes the word, quote, enables, unquote, which means giving a person the authority or means to do something and replaces it with, quote, informs, unquote, which has an entirely different meaning. It further limits decision making as to the merits of a petition to just two people, that being the director and the commission chair. It would allow the division to silence a petitioner's opportunity to rebut a denial, no matter how compelling the merits of that rebuttal. And in certain cases, the proposal would prevent a petition from moving forward for up to five years. The proposed rule change does not represent the best interests of the majority of Coloradans who utilize its parks, and it's tacitly giving those in authority absolute control over the public's right to try and amend or repeal any rule. As opposed to a democratic process, this seems to create a totalitarian system where the public can be silenced when there's a disagreement over a rule or regulation. And I strongly object to the um, proposed rule change in its current form and would request that the commission revisit uh, the serious implications that this could have for the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halpern. I appreciate your time and, and um, being willing to, to bring your thoughts to us today. Um, Commissioner Garcia, do you have question, a, a comment or question for Mr. Halpern? Yes, I do. Uh, Mr. Halpern, I, I just wanted to clarify because I understand your concerns, particularly when you said it was a two person decision being the director and the chair. Uh, it, it's fairly, very clear uh, that if the division, for instance, were to oppose a petition, uh, that any one of the commissioners can ask that that item be taken off of the consent agenda. And so you still have the ability to um, try and, and reach out to us as commissioners, which again, uh, this current petition is a good example. We got tons of emails and a lot of information. I got texts, phone calls, uh, people reaching out to us as commissioners. And in doing so, if uh, one or more commissioners are convinced that your petition should be taken off of the consent agenda, they simply asked and it is. So it's not a two person decision. It's still left up to the entire commission. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that clarification. Uh, that's not the way I read it, but again, I'm not an attorney, so um, I could be misinterpreting it. Um, thank you, Commissioner Garcia and, and Mr. Halpern. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Halpern? Um, let's hear. Let's hear another. We do have one more signed up for public, and then um, I think there are some additional questions and conversation after that. So thank you, Katie. Do you want to call the next name? Sure. So next up we have John Murtaugh. So it looks like we're unmuting John. Um, John, would you like us to turn on your camera? That's all right. I'll try to be quick. Okay. No problem. Go ahead. Then we'll start your two minutes. Great. So I just want to, uh, of course, offer my thanks to the commission and to our uh, non-voting representatives who are here today. I uh, really appreciate the time. My name is John Murtaugh. I'm here uh, representing Defenders of Wildlife, and I'm based out here in Lakewood, Colorado. Um, I think Mr. Halpern certainly captured uh, the core of my concerns. Um, so without belaboring the point, uh, I'll just offer that's my suggestion that the vote be delayed until we can clarify this language. Um, it seems to me right now there is some ambiguity in this and that it seems to depend on good faith um, rather than having strong language to restrict um, this process with uh, our, as Mr. Rowland said, our two person, uh, the commission and chair and the director having uh, an un undue exertion of power um, over this procedure. Um, so certainly in, in simple terms, just a request uh, that we revise that language and add a little bit more strength and clarity there. Thank you, Mr. Murtaugh. Um, any questions directly for Mr. Murtaugh? Okay, Commissioner Haskett, I know you have a question or comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, give a little bit of feedback to both Roland and John. Um, 
we've seen a big increase in citizens petitions. And in November, the commission actually asked staff uh, to look at the process. And the commissioners have a limited time on every agenda and all of our agendas are packed. Um, and I wrote a little bit about that. So today more than ever, the pendulum swings so far to the left and right that the actual proven science can be misconstrued by both sides. I believe that CPW staff looks at all sides of each issue and brings back the best possible science to the commission. That's all. Thank you, Commissioner Haskett. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and this was we did we did talk about this in November. Um, we have seen you know a, a steady increase, and and of course we talked about it again in January and looked at the beginnings of of the staff proposed changes. Um, so thank you for bringing that up as well. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I'll echo a bit of what uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Askett mentioned is that we're looking for flexibility and being able to run around agendas and, and get to the priorities that both staff have, but also as commissioners, that we want to advance certain policies, programs, opportunities that we aren't able to otherwise. And I think there's also needs to be an understanding of the constraints of the Open Meetings Act. When we we have an opportunity to debate an issue, the only opportunity is the commission meeting. We, 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 we have to be able to utilize the time to the greatest extent possible. And that requires flexibility and setting agendas as well as looking at what are the most pressing issues of the day. So I, I recognize that there is a, a undercurrent of suspicion or fear when it comes to anything that seemingly constrains public comment or public involvement. I don't see this change as doing either of those things. Uh, as Commissioner Garcia remarked upon, uh, any single one of us have the ability to uh, bring, bring to the floor uh, any citizen petition that has been placed on the consent agenda in order to promulgate some discussion uh, if there is a disagreement in, in place with the staff's recommendation. So to me, I don't see this as necessarily uh, constraining the ability for the public to uh, initiate um, a, a rulemaking process it, it, through, the, through the petitioning. But what I do see is the ability for us to be able to uh, prioritize the, the work of the commission um, as well as promulgate uh, more serious discussion about what, what I consider to be a, a great number of, uh, of challenges facing this agency in Colorado as a whole. Um, and thus far, uh, my term in the commission, I've more often than that, I've wished we've had more opportunity for discussion, but oftentimes I'll look at the agenda and see that there's four more hours and 32 more agenda items that we need to get to without uh, belaboring a point. So I appreciate what staff has brought us. I think it's a, it's a good balance that hopefully allows us to uh, get towards uh, prioritizing some of those big ticket items that we've, we've thus far haven't been able to tackle. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. Commissioner Adams. Yes, hello. Um, this is a really important topic and I, I really resonate with what, with what uh, Commissioner Haskett raised around just the pendulum swinging uh, across in the extremes. And I do have some concerns around this particular proposal um, swinging into uh, a little bit, maybe a little too far in the uh, discretion area. Um, as you know, the commissioners are appointed by the governor. Um, and so that commissioner, the citizens pe petition mechanism allows for, uh, you know, that those who may not be in this decision making uh, position to still have a voice. And so I'm just wondering, and, and, and at the same time, I would agree that we have, because there's not um, the citizen petition is, there's only one process. And so that process I think is on the other side of the pendulum, which is too easy to get onto the agenda. So I'm just wondering if there's some kind of mechanism where uh, if there was a certain threshold of on the petition or as it relates to um, number of signatures, number of organizations that have signed on, number of, you know, I think one of the petitions that had come, there was a lack of engagement by some of the key stakeholder groups 
an organization. So that was a huge pushback. So I'm not sure if there could be some kind of criteria that identified four petitions that would then kind of bump it up in the review process so that, um, you know, if there is a large citizen push or agreement around something, um, there is some mechanism for getting it onto the agenda beyond the discretion of, uh, of a commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Um, Jake, I, I don't know if you are the right person to answer Commissioner Adams' question. Perhaps that might, that could be um, Krista. But Jake, I do I do want to call on you after Krista to just help us clarify some some of the confusion we may have around this. Krista, can you answer Commissioner Adams, or is that just something that maybe we need to look into further? Yeah, I think I think we would want to look into that a little bit further. Um, you know, it could be something that you know, maybe as an internal guidance um, to, you know, staff uh, when thinking about petitions. Um, uh, you know, that's just something off the top of my head, but but yeah, I'll defer to Councillor Matter on, on those questions as well. Sure, let me address uh, Commissioner Adams' question first. Um, the, the first thing that came to my mind when you asked that question was um, the policy. And so I think they're really two separate things. What's the rule say and how is it implemented? And how it's implemented, I think you could address that concern. Um, you know, there there may be a petition that's opposed by the division, for example, but there's a uh, you know change.org petition signed and it has 7,000 signatures on it. I think in that situation, um, the division would think twice about immediately opposing the petition and instead work through what's described as the sort of everything else bucket, which requires further thought and, and consultation with DNR or the chair or other commissioners. Um, so I, I think the first two buckets of division opposed and division supported, I got that backwards, division, division supported is very similar to this, the current process. So if, if you're in either one of those buckets, it's, it's an easier answer for me. But I think the third bucket could really be the biggest and meaning further consultation is required, further thought is required, checking in. And that's sort of the benefit of the rule change is that it enables the process to slow down a little bit. You know, the current rule says in the event a timely citizen petition is filed, it will be noticed for rulemaking. And that I think to a certain extent puts the cart before the horse. We don't know what the commission is thinking. Um, you know, the director's report could be a, a good um, vehicle for saying, we got this petition a week ago, I wanted to bring it to your attention. If it's something you're particularly concerned about or um, have other thoughts about, please call me and let me know how you want to handle this. So I, I think separating the, the rule from the policy is, is an important distinction for the question you raised, but I also want to address you know some of the comments we've received about impairing the the citizens' right to petition the government for the airing of grievances, really, or for a regulatory change. Uh, I talk a lot about the APA, which is the State Administrative Procedures Act. The APA applies to every agency in Colorado who promulgates rules. Um, the APA says any person can petition an agency for a rule change. We're, we can't change that and we're not changing it. And this proposal is not meant to change that right. We, we can't impair that right in any way. The proposed change to W16 is merely um, tinkering with how we handle those petitions once they're received and enabling the commission to set its own agendas and, and priorities instead of an immediate hearing or an immediate uh, resolution of the petition. And also, I think it sets expectations for people who file citizens' petitions. Um, I think in the past, they haven't been immediately heard, and that's through a sort of cooperative arrangement with the division and the petitioner, but you have a rule that suggests it's going to be heard immediately, and in, 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 in the past, that hasn't been the case. It's been multiple steps down the road in terms of hearings. Um, and and, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. This is something that um, is obviously important, and we've, you know, I think the division's given a lot of thought to. 
Thank you, Councillor Matter. Um, Commissioner McDaniel has a question as well. Um, I just, I'm a little concerned we get, we might get too cookie cutter with her criteria. Um, one of the benefits, I think, of being able to, that any commissioner can take it off the consent agenda and have it brought it forward to the commission is because, you know, if, even if there was one person who supports it and that commissioner felt very passionate about it and had good, you know, reasoning to, to bring it before the entire commission, they could do so. I'm a little afraid we say, well, you know, you have to have five organizations or 500 signatures or whatever. Um, it will be, become too prescriptive. Um, and certain really important petitions may not come to us because it didn't meet that criteria and others um, could that may not necessarily be the ones we need to get on our agenda uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I do think that the staff put an incredible amount of work into this to provide the greatest opportunity for petitions to come to this commission. And remembering that the commission is appointed by the governor um, so it is a counterbalancing, I'll call it in some respects, to the agency. So even if there was a strong feeling from the agency in one respect, any one commissioner can still have that, that petition brought forward. And I think that's a great system. So I'm really supportive of the, of the recommendation of the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McDaniel. Commissioner Garcia. Uh, yes, and, and, I, and that gets back to, again, I think uh, the importance of our ability to take things off the consent agenda. I think those of us who have been on the commission know, and we've seen it happen. We've seen commissioners ask to have things taken off of the consent agenda, and they are. Uh, and there are a lot more. I know there was one item on the consent agenda this time around that I called staff and talk to them about it because I had concerns about it. Uh, and if the staff had not uh, answered my concerns in a way I felt was uh, sufficient, I would have asked that that matter be brought off the consent agenda. So I just wanna make sure that we don't underestimate the power of the commissioners uh, when, it really, when it comes to the division and the chair simply issuing a denial that, that that's not the end of the road and that all of us as commissioners pay a lot of attention to all of the emails and all of the things that come before us. And if there is a petition, even without being contacted, we will see it on the consent agenda. We will review it. And if for some reason we feel that it does not meet the criteria for the consent agenda, we simply ask it to be brought off. So I, I think that power alone provides me with all of the safety net I need in this change and I support these changes. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Um, any, any additional discussion? And then I'm gonna call for a motion. And of course, between the motion and the, and the second, um, we, we can have additional discussion about that specific motion. Okay, so the first one is gonna be regarding the rulemaking and then I'll do, we'll vote on that second one will be regarding the policy. Um, I think I said that right. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt changes to chapter W16 related to revising the process by which the division and the commission respond to citizen petitions for rulemaking as proposed by staff? So moved. Second. Okay. I had, there we go. <laughs> I, was, I had hands and then I had people. So I think we got Commissioner Hauser and Commissioner Schaefer. Um, any additional discussion before Laura calls the roll? Okay, Laura, can you please call the roll? Adams? Yes. Blecka? Yes. Bray? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Haskett? Yes. Hauser? Yes. McDaniel? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Vardy? Yes. Vigil? Yes. Chair Zimmerman? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Laura. And then a sec the second motion 
I'm going to read out as well. Is there a motion to adopt the updated Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission policy entitled Citizen Petitions to Initiate Rulemaking, replacing the commission's current policy entitled Public Rulemaking Petitions? And you can either unmute or raise your hand. Commissioner Bray? I make that motion. Great. And okay. Commissioner Garcia has a hand as well. Second. Great. Any discussion regarding the policy? Okay, Laura, please call the roll. And I'm doing roll call just because we're not in person and with people listening and not being able to see what's going on. I, it just seems like a more appropriate way to do things. So Laura, please call the roll. Adams? Yes. Lekka? Yes. Ray? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Haskett? Yes. Hauser? Yes. McDaniel? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Vardy? Yes. Vigil? Yes. Chair Zimmerman? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you to everyone and on staff and, and to the public um, comment folks and folks that have written in on, with public comment with regard to this. Um, I think it was incredibly helpful because it did really help us define the changes to the rule and regs, the policy, um, and really made sure that obviously we, we want to be very available to the public and to the public process. So um, really appreciate everyone's work on this. Uh, moving on to agenda item 12, Fletcher Jacobs, are you on the line with us? I am. Just a second. Madam Chair, Directors, members of the Commission, Council, uh, my name is Fletcher Jacobs, State Trails Program Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm here today to present on the 2020 non-motorized um, trail grant funding recommendations. Um, the non-motorized grant program provides funding for trail construction, maintenance, and planning projects across the state. The grant program is a multi-agency partnership that includes Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Great Outdoors Colorado, the Federal Recreation Trails Program, and the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund Program. Local, county, and state governments federal agencies, special recreation districts, and nonprofit organizations with management responsibilities over public lands may apply for and are eligible to receive non-motorized trail grants through this program. The non-motorized recreational trail grant applications, um, the, the cycle starts the beginning of August, and this year that actually started on August 1st. Uh, the trail grant opportunities are published through press releases, newsletters, of course our website, and our email and um, informational networks. As the first step in the grant process, we ask that by September 3rd, each applicant emails a basic project scope and map um, of their proposed project to their area wildlife manager for review. This allows our field staff to have time to review the potential projects and discuss and hopefully address the potential wildlife issues directly with the applicant prior to the submission deadline of the first business day in October. Upon submission, the State Trails Committee has created a structure to assist them in formulating these grant recommendations that we I bring to you today. These subcommittees for each grant category review and rank the grants and compile funding recommendations for the committee. Subcommittee members including um, include standing committee members, representatives from Great Outdoors Colorado, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife Trails Program staff, as well as volunteer peer reviewers. Appendix A lists the individual members who served on each subcommittee, as well as our, the membership of our State Trails Committee. All non-motorized trail grant applications are evaluated and ranked against each other. After receiving the recommendations from the committee, uh, and as I said, come to you today for approval, uh, these grants will be rewarded for non-motorized trail projects that are actually scheduled to begin this summer. So with that as kind of the background, just as a reminder, I presented in the July 2019 commission meeting in Telluride on the changes that we were making to this year's cycle. Um, the first one there is really, we ran a pilot this year based on your approval to change what had formerly been a, something we've been looking at for a number of years. Our previous grant categories 
were called large construction and maintenance, which allowed for um, projects that were both construction and maintenance to be scored against each other with a maximum of $250,000 um, for those grants. Um, we also had a small construction and maintenance category, which allowed for projects that were at a maximum of $45,000, but again, included both construction and maintenance, and then a final planning and support category. Uh, one of the long conversations that we've had, I know that this commission um, is also interested in, and the State Trails Committee has been really focused on this issue of figuring out a better way to fund the over 45,000 miles of trail we currently have in Colorado and do a better job of turning our funding um, to make sure we're taking care of those trails. So we piloted this this year, and I'll, I'll be explaining more about that, but we actually separated out our grant categories differently to have one construction, one maintenance, and then kept the planning and support. The idea with that, it would be able to more have a more apples to apples comparison between construction projects, between maintenance projects, and also discuss our funding all allocation. Um, the second change we made um, was we actually updated our scoring criteria to ensure we are properly considering wildlife impacts when we're doing these grants. Um, the, the first change was literally updating that scoring. So that criteria is now weighted at 15 points, which um, put it at equal with the rest of the price criteria, including scope, planning, um, the maintenance and, and operations of, of the trail system, um, the public comment, as well as the ability of the applicant to actually uh, carry forth the grant. We also added additional questions in about the impacts to wildlife and habitat and how the applicant would do their best to avoid and minimize those um, as far as fragmentation. And also if during the conversations with their local wildlife managers, if there was discussion around things like seasonal closure, how they would plan to support that. We also made sure the applicants included maps of the proposed areas that included existing roads and trails to help our, our local field staff as well as our grant reviewers better understand the impacts on the landscape level. Finally, we also asked our applicants specific questions about how they plan to decommission and restore any existing trails um, that have been deemed unsustainable. And finally, um, we discussed this back in July, but we continue to work with our regional staff on our wildlife impact assessment process. Um, we'll obviously continue to, to make sure we're our regional staff feel comfortable with that and that was definitely the case last year and the biggest change that we've brought forth to you today is we now share those regional memos that address all the grant application wildlife assessments that we receive. As continuing with the um, how we evaluate and address wildlife concerns you can look there I, I already mentioned part of the process is for the non-motorized grants we actually ask before the grant submission for those applicants to reach out directly to their local wildlife manager um, so they can have those discussions. And these are the, you can see there, the special status species, the habitats, wildlife impacts, environmental compliance, education, interpretation, and then the recommended design features and mitigation are the, um, the big pieces that we're looking at. And then I think the, the bottom piece there is just a, a good reminder. We mentioned the subcommittees. Um, I think it's just a good visual of, these are the various levels of review that these projects go through starting with our field biologists, our, our wildlife managers, up to our regional staff, our trails coordinators, our deputy regional managers, and then finally to the regional managers who share those wildlife impact assessments with us at the, the state trails program level. Um, and then we share those directly with the non-motorized subcommittee. Um, with the non-motorized, we review the grants and then we actually have each of the applicants come present to the subcommittees um, at this level right here. And that's our, our opportunity. We share, of course, those wildlife impact directly with those applicants and ask them to directly address those so we can uh, properly score them. Uh, we then bring that to our state trails committee and finally our step today to the Parks and Wildlife Commission. So for this year's um, this year's applications you can see we received a, a total of 26 trail grants and we broke this out. Um, I, I know I mentioned three categories but we broke about it out a little bit differently just because of the land and water conservation fund and we actually treat the planning and support slightly differently. But just to give you a big picture, we have 26 total applications with the total dollar request of a little over $4.3 million. Um, always when we're talking about a grant program, it's of course very important to talk about the source of funding. So the three different pots I mentioned it is definitely a partnership between our, our partners here with Great Outdoors Colorado. Um, they invest $1 million into our program to help further their strategic goal to connect people to the outdoors um, and connect them to trails, parks, and open, state, um, open space. We also, the Recreational Trails Program, the RTP dollars, those are funds um, coming through the Federal Highway, um, Federal Highway Association um, to develop and maintain recreational trails and facilities 
by returning federal um, fuel excise tax that is collected from off-highway vehicles, snowmobiles, and off-highway light trucks. And then finally, we mentioned the Land and Water Conservation Fund. LWCF is funded by offshore federal oil and gas drilling lease revenues that are appropriated annually by con Congress. Uh, Colorado receives and manages this managing grant program to provide funds to state and local governments that must be used for the acquisition, construction, or redevelopment of areas for public recreational purposes and publicly accessible outdoor facilities, including trips. So when you added up the various dollars, we had approximately a little over $2.6 million to give, um, to give away this year. So getting directly into it, we mentioned the, the three different categories. So for the construction, you can see the projects there. Um, the projects at the top, obviously in, in white, are the ones that we are recommended for funding. Um, you can certainly see the, the final scores. We had set a minimum this year for 70 being our, our cutoff for funding projects. And looking at the construction projects, uh, we were very happy to see that we were funding projects um, that were all scored upwards of 82. Moving to the maintenance category, I think this is the, the real interesting thing to, to me this year that I really want to highlight. By switching to being able to look at this maintenance, one of the things we really talked about was just the allocation of funding between the categories. Previous allocations had really been based on the ask. So for example, if in that total dollar grant amount ask, if 75% of the total amount was for construction, we previously would always give 70 percent Five percent of those available funds to that that construction category. Um, this year, looking at the maintenance, one of the conversations that we talked a lot about um, with the committee, with the subcommittee, as well as with the committee, and came to a, some agreement that we definitely wanted to support more maintenance projects, and we want to certainly continue to see this moving forward. So the State Trails Committee is recommending funding a higher percentage of maintenance projects. So actually upping the allocation we would have given this was 19 percent of the total ask, but we actually realized we wanted to fund that at a full third. So actually um, up that and would put the amount funded to approximately 600, a little over $601,000 funding five of the grants. Um, I think it's, again, we changed this pilot this year, so it's a little bit hard to compare apples to apples, but just a quick review of last year's projects, again, where it was large maintenance construction, small maintenance construction competing against there. We had approximately, I think we gave up away about 96 and a half. Um, yeah, I think it was 96, um, $96,000. So definitely a big increase in maintenance projects this year, which is something that our, our committee wanted to see. And, and we're glad to, um, glad to see that. I specifically, um, what's important for the, the commission to understand, we actually, if, if approved for these levels of funding, we would, um, based for these crews, we would be hiring a four-person seasonal crew for six months for uh, the Forest Service, uh, two different eight-person youth corps crews, for one for eight weeks and then one for 18 weeks. And then for the Colorado 14ers initiative, it would be approximately 23 different crew members um, for various lengths of time across the state uh, working on our, our 14er trails. And then finally, the last slide, completing our, our fun color overview here, um, you see the, the planning trails um, category. We're recommending three of those projects um, all of that is scored above 82. And then finally, in the, in the support category, we're recommending funding just a little bit below, we ran out of money um, to fund this project, but essentially funding it uh, just under their, their full, full ask to help with training for volunteers for Outdoor Colorado. And then finally, at the very bottom, you see the, the Land Water Conservation Fund project, the Bear Creek Trail Improvement Project for the City of Lakewood, um, which is improving and expanding their existing trail system there um, to account for public safety. So put up, pulling that all together, here's that funding allocations pulled back for the grant category. And again, the, the biggest change there was based on previous allocations, this would have been a, a, a smaller number. We decided the, the State Trails Committee uh, felt comfortable with moving that allocation to really try to do a better job of focusing, focusing on maintenance, uh, again, of our existing trails and took that direct funding from the allocation standpoint from you know, deciding to fund essentially funding um, less construction projects. So um, coming, Coming to you, we would have 16 total grants for a proposed funding amount of a little over $2.6 million. With that, I will open it up to any questions. Thank you, Fletcher. Um, any questions for Mr. Jacobs? Uh, we have Commissioner McDaniel. Thank you. Um, could you give me a little insight please on the North Elk Creek Trail phase two. Um, 
maybe it, it didn't go a lot into how long that, unless I missed it, um, the closure would be um, and how concerned the DWMs were with regards to the um, intrusion that trail would make into some of these um, specifically sensitive wildlife areas? Yes, I think our big, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up my little notes specifically on that project. Um, we were able in the conversations with our, with the Northeast regional staff and with the, the field, field staff there to make them feel comfortable with the seasonal closures. I know in their wildlife comment letter, they had some, some mention of, you know, having some concern around that parking lot there, but the mountain bike group, uh, Comba, who's coming for that grant, was able to meet with our area wildlife managers, have that conversation. It does connect with Staunton State Park. So, um, you know, it's a, an area that's certainly seeing increased use. So the wildlife manager wanted to make sure everybody was on board with, as we begin to build this trail, um, what it would look like. And they felt comfortable um, continuing to support this grant. Um, kind of a follow-up. So when it says phase two, is that final phase or is there anticipation that there would be more with regards to this um, package of trails? I believe the anticipation was this was the final phase. This would connect in with Staunton State Park, um, which is uh, part of the larger vision, um, but would not be included with this grant. Staunton uh, will be doing that on their own. Okay, and then my second question was, um, and then maybe it's just the way I'm reading it, uh, is that, you know, we seem to have um, more emphasis on trails that are, um, I don't know, in more wild areas, I'll call it, whether it be forest or, or whatever, um, BLM land. And the, some of the city projects or trails that were closer to the cities didn't seem to score as well after this recent epidemic, I'm sure we wish we had more trails close to the city that folks could could use. Um, I guess it's not so much a comment on this planning process, but maybe in the future that, you know, we it costs a lot of money to add parks in some of these cities and it's hard for us to do so. Maybe we could give some more emphasis to trails closer to cities uh, in the future planning process versus ones that are farther out. That's just a general comment. Thank you. I appreciate that comment, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Schaefer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of comments. One, uh, I really appreciate the emphasis on maintenance. I think that it's uh, it's money better spent, in my opinion, um, and uh, it's important to take care of what we've already created. Secondly, I, I also just wanted to, to give kudos on including the, uh, again, the uh, uh, region reports regarding wildlife impacts. And if anything, if I could encourage uh, those regional managers to go into more detail, I think it's always welcome to understand what the, the thinking is from our managers in terms of um, where the potential problems either lie or potentially lie um, so that there is a public articulation of um, the good, bad, and the ugly, because there's no project that's per perfect, um, and everything can be improved. And this is a process in which we're we're talking about uh, those uh, potential improvements in a public manner. And um, without this information from the regions, it's very difficult for most commissioners to have a, a real clue of what's going on. So, again, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. I think that that Harkin about you know more more connections and systems level conversations um, with when when presenting things to the commission. So thank you. Any other comments, discussion around this agenda item for Fletcher before we before I call for a vote? Okay. Um, the only thing I would add, Fletcher, I know you know we've we've said a couple of things. Um, many times in the past uh, for the whole eight years that, you know, Commissioners Bray and Beal and I have been on the commission, I've heard it. Um, less construction, less new trail, more maintenance, more education, more outreach. And, you know, we still have a pretty significant, you know, 2X in construction versus versus the next item um, 
down the list. And I, I think that has a lot to do with just the the proposals we're getting and the quality of the projects. And and I'm thinking as I, you know, obviously as I was looking at some of this, um, my question for you, if you could just expand on it is when we are funding construction um, or new trails, is there also a BMP around maintenance and operations? Um, you know, I, I know in the Habitat Stamp Program, we encourage any easement to have a Color Parks and Wildlife approved management plan in place. So I think that would help assuage some of my <laughs> um, concerns, knowing that anytime we fund construction, it comes with a very um, rigorous management plan to ensure maintenance and enforcement. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we used to have a pilot program that uh, partnered with BLM and Forest Service and part-time um, seasonal, seasonal full-time employees to be out enforcing trails, stay the trail rules and um, other regulations. So just wondered if you could comment a little bit on that. And then I do have two more hands that are raised. Definitely, um, Madam Chair. And yes, when we do have the construction projects, that is the, the question for them is specifically asking for their operational and, and maintenance plan, um, asking them to turn that into us, talking uh, to us about how it will be maintained. Are they planning on just coming back in for new trails next year? What is the, the long-term plan? And I think to uh, Commissioner McDaniel's question earlier, is this a multi-phase plan? How is this going to be developed? And really getting them to push. And I think that was um, thinking about this year's construction grants, um, I think we really funded projects that came with that, um, that had a maintenance component built in. I, I noticed there's a real big scoring drop um, between the projects we are recommending for funding and the ones we are not. So, but that's definitely something we can continue to, uh, we have to continue to press on. And I think anecdotally, um, talking with various land managers, that's definitely been something as they've noticed we are interested in actually funding crews on the ground for not uh, non-motorized uh, trails that they're definitely interested in. I've, again, just having these conversations uh, with various land managers, they've said that's something that's of great interest to them moving forward. So I anticipate if um, sneak preview for next week, I'll be back talking about this item. Um, I, I hope we can continue to have this uh, pilot of running this again to have maintenance and, and show that indeed we can continue to fund this uh, very important need. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I know that, uh, Madam Chair, you said that there was one item that was on the March agenda that didn't get carried over. We're going to deal with in May, which was the operational plan, but there were some more. And one of them was uh, the planning trail development in mind. Uh, and I'm sorry we missed that in March and uh, didn't get to hear it, but it looks like we're going to hear it in May. Uh, so I look forward to that. And I also see that on the non-motorized trails grants, there's a pilot categories that you're going to be bringing to us in May as well. Uh, so uh, I also thank you for all the work you've done, but I do look forward to having those discussions in May. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Um, Commissioner Blecka. Hi, I just wanted to add the comment that, um, and I'm sure Fletcher could probably give you the correct information, but of these projects that were even considered, there's only a handful that are outside of the I-25 corridor on the east side, out on the Eastern Plains. And when you look at the construction um, recommendation, grant number 10 is the city of Fort Morgan. And that's the only one on the Eastern Plains that's been accepted. And so I understand your reservation about, you know, building more trails, but for, for that example, to have that project out here, like it's a really good idea. And it was fully funded, the whole ask. So I just wanted to like, thank the committee for, for, for that, but also, you know, like that trail, for example, is, you know, a non-traditional applicant for us. I just want to put that out there. No, fair comment. Comment. Thank you for bringing that up. I, um, it's not just a blanket, no more new trails. It's it's more just a, um, again, or another reference to let's make sure we're doing the right thing in the right place. And so you just, yeah, made that point. So thank you. Okay, any other questions for Fletcher? All right, um, this is a long one, so bear with me. Okay, this is for agenda item 12. I'm gonna be asking for a motion. In accordance with section 3311-106 of the Colorado Revised Statutes, is there a motion to approve the scores and associated rankings for the Recreational Trail Committee's 
grant review and ranking subcommittees that were assigned to the 2020 non-motorized trails grant applications and to recommend that the available non-motorized grant funding be awarded in accordance with the recreation trail committee's recommended funding allocation outlined in the discussion and summary section of this action item allowing for minor adjustments and project funding levels being permitted at the discretion of Parks and Wildlife Division Director. That's the full motion. Happy to read it again. It's essentially just funding what Fletcher presented. So moved. <laughs> All right, we've got Commissioner Schaefer. And Second, please help. Commissioner Schaefer, did you add a hand up for more further discussion or were you gonna second? Uh, I either make the motion or second. Okay. Same. Got it. <laughs> yeah, Howard, Hauser and Schaefer on that one. Um, VL, I heard you. I'm gonna, you'll have to jump in sooner on the next one. <laughs> um, Laura, any additional discussion? All right, Laura, please call the roll. Adams. Yes. Lecca. Yes. Bray. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Haskett. Yes. Hauser. Yes. McDaniel. Yes. Schaefer. Yes. Vardy. Yes. Vigil. Yes. Chair Zimmerman. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Fletcher, you're still on. Yes. You're still on for agenda item 13. Yes. Sorry. Trying to... There we go. So we will continue. Um, and this one is a, a fairly simple um, action item. Uh, outdoor Re Recreation Legacy Partnership grant funding recommendation. Um, this is a, oops, sorry, technical difficulties here. So I'm coming with this from the State Trails Committee, another recommendation. Um, in 2018, the National Park Service, who uh, administers the Land, Water, and Conservation Fund, um, put forth a competitive grant program called the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership, which I'll just call ORLOP from now on. Uh, the purpose of the ORLOP program is to provide grants to acquire and develop public lands for outdoor recreation purposes, consistent with Land Water Conservation Fund, but with the very specific goals that they are primarily focused on serving jurisdictions delineated by the census as urbanized areas, so with populations of 50,000 or more people. So eligible in Colorado, uh, Denver, Aurora, Lakewood, Boulder, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, Greeley, Grand Junction, and then Lafayette, Louisville, and Erie are kind of combined together, Longmont and Pueblo. Um, as beyond just being within one of these areas, uh, the projects that they were specifically looking for are projects that were located uh, or directly accessible to neighborhoods or communities that were underserved in terms of parks and recreational resources, um, or where there's significant population of people who are economically dis disadvantaged. Um, this is a program that MPS started, the National Park Service started in 2015, and we actually, the state of Colorado was awarded one of the first ORLOP grants uh, for the Denver Parks and Recreation Montbello Open Space, a partnership um, also with our CPW's partner, Environmental Learning for Kids, was also involved with that grant. Um, since then, MPS has tried to do this every year um, due to just various issues occasionally with, with the, the federal government. That has not always been the case. And in 2018, we did an internal review of the app, um, applications. Each state is allowed to submit up to three grant proposals. Um, we put a call out to those various eligible entities, uh, worked with them uh, via our trails program staff here in Denver, as well as our regional staff. And we're given, we're given several projects to discuss and decided that one project um, we took to the leadership team for approval um, to compete for that 2018 ORLOP grant. And that project was the Legacy Loop Rock Island Trail segment in Colorado Springs. So just as a brief kind of overview of what we're talking about, this is I-25 here um, in Colorado Springs. And then this is a little bit of close up from their original application. Again, this is I-25 here. 
Um, this was a project that was supported by our regional staff. We had reviewed it. We had actually funded a portion of this trail as part of the original Colorado the Beautiful grant cycle. Um, unfortunately, just due to timing, the actual application was turned in in 2018. Um, due to the federal government shutdown and just kind of various, um, various issues, we unfortunately did not receive word until the, um, December 27th of 2019 um, that this was a project that while competitive, um, since it was a national program, they actually received 51 applications and only selected 11 for funding. So unfortunately, uh, our partners uh, in Colorado Springs, the city um, had been just kind of holding because they'd been waiting for the funding to actually move forward. And um, I, I think just kind of jokingly got tired of calling us every month to hear if we'd heard something from MPS. Um, when we finally heard in early January that it had not been selected, we reached out to the National Park Service for some feedback to discuss with them, to share with the applicant. They actually suggested to us that you know this was a strong project. Um, it was one that definitely supported um, you know kind of the overall goals, and they actually recommended we consider funding it with our own LWCF allotment. So we actually took this back to our regional staff again. It is a project that had been reviewed previously um, by our wildlife staff, but went back to our regional staff to make sure there were no additional wildlife concerns. Um, and that is in the, your action item. You have the the full application that we turned into. Um, into NPS as well as a review of the wildlife um, issues. The regional staff supported this project. We brought it to our state trails committee um, in January and they recommended bringing this uh, for funding for, with their additional LWCF allotment um, and for $750,000. So with that, it, again, fairly straightforward. Um, I would open it up to any questions. Okay, I gotta get my participant list back up. All right. Um, Commissioner Vigil, did you have a comment or question? No, I don't. I think okay. I messed up the last time. Okay. Um, looks like my internet connection is being funny. Hopefully you can still hear me. All right. Fletcher, thank you. And thanks to everyone who was involved in this. This is a giant lift of, um, of a project and over many years. So pretty, pretty impressive. Um, I'll go ahead and call. This is a much shorter motion uh, since I don't see any discussion. I'll go ahead and call for a motion. It's 13. And this is the motion is in accordance with section 3311-106 of the Colorado Revised Statutes. Is there a motion that the State Recreational Trails Committee approve the recommendation for funding I think that I, I feel like that should say that the commission would approve the recommendation. Um, yeah, well, I'm gonna keep, okay. Yeah, Is there a motion that the commission uh, approve the recommendation for funding this project with the land water conservation funds? Don't move. Commissioner V. Hill. Second. Commissioner Schaefer. Laura, can you please, any other discussion? Laura, please call the roll. Yes. Fleca? Yes. Bray? Yes. Garcia? Nice, nice catch, Chair. Yes. Haskett? Yes. Hauser? Yes. McDaniel? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Vardy? Yes. Vigil? Yes. Chair Zimmerman? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Great. Yeah, I had a I had an image of, of Anchorman where he just reads the teleprompter. It doesn't matter what it says. <laughs> um, we'll move on to our last agenda item number 14, which is the consent agenda. Um, any is there a motion any discussion around consent agenda? I know we already talked about pulling anything and we didn't have any, but just want on Anyone else see anything that came up? And if not, is there a motion? Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Commissioner McDaniel. Second. Com Commissioner Haskett with a second, I think. And Laura, please call the roll. Adams? Yes. Lecca? Yes. Ray? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Haskett? Yes. Hauser? Yes. 
McDaniel? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Vardy? Yes. Vigil? Yes. Chair Zimmerman? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. All right, a couple other quick notes. Um, you'll notice this is, I think, our one of our only commission meetings where we didn't have a GOCO update. I think um, I just want to note that's because we did get the update from Emily over email for the March edition, and she is on the agenda for May. So, um, and I think you probably saw, I think we're all on the email list um, regarding updates on their strategic plan. So, uh, of course, Emily, if you, I think Emily is on the line. If, if you know, you want to raise your hand, if there's anything you need to say or would like to give us an update, you're welcome to do so. Um, the other, the other uh, thing I wanted to mention is that we, you know, we will, we did extend the ability for people to sign up to make public comment. Um, you do have to go to the website and you have to sign up in advance if they want to make comment like we did today over the Zoom meeting. Um, we certainly, I think hopefully the public is, is realizing we're certainly hearing and reading all of the written public comment that does make these Zoom meetings easier. So written, written comment is going to be preferable for us with these virtual meetings. Um, and then again, if, if anyone listening has public comment to make that is not specific to an agenda item, you can also sign up for that on um, either just on email or on the, the comment spreadsheet if you want to make an in-person comment. So just a quick public comment housekeeping. And then I just wanted to extend a giant thank you. Oh, Commissioner Garcia has a hand up. I was just looking quickly at the May agenda. And I remembered that we uh, gave the director uh, different powers in one of our emergency meetings. And we did that to continue up through that meeting so that we didn't have to redo that. Uh, I just want to make sure that we, if we need to update that, that it ends up on the May agenda. I think, I think staff are probably on top of that, but yeah, I think everyone would, would um, second, third and fourth that comment. So staff, let us know if anything needs to be added then. Thank you. Um, this, you know, Obviously, all of our meetings have a significant logistical component um, running in the background, and even more so when it's a virtual meeting like this. So I just wanted to say thank you to Dion Cool, to Levi Ramel, to Josh Simpson. He's our Zoom. He's been with us all day listening to our so exciting uh, regulatory conversations. He's from Zoom, and he's been on the line making sure that this goes smoothly. Um, Kirk Teklitz, Katie Leinter, Krista Heiner, Jody Kennedy, Sarah Studebaker, Laura Porter, of course, thank you. Um, Mike Kertuch, Jake Matter, Jonathan Boyston, Lauren Truitt, all of her team for, and Katie for really getting the message out, the emails and the um, notices and the website updates and the links and, and doing everything we've had to do um, to switch to this virtual uh, situation. So um, if I didn't say your name, I, I thank you as well. And um, just a big thank you to the staff for, for making this happen. That's all I have, um, staff or commissioners. Any <clears throat> anyone else have anything, or we can adjourn. Madam all right, Clerk, Director Prenzler. Just want to say thanks and reiterate what you said. Um, I chuckled with Commissioner Garcia. I thought you had to be real careful about giving me any extra power. So, but uh, with that extra power, I say we ought to adjourn. It's almost five. That's decision, so. Yeah, that's my decision. Come on, back off. <laughs> don't want to don't want to step on the you know the third rail. So thanks, Director Prenzel. I know you have been this has made your job even even more exciting. So um, we'll see everyone next next week. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.